Of all the five shows I've watched in my lifetime, none have left a mark on me quite like Twin Peaks. While Better Call Saul might hold the title for my favourite show, or at least the show that I've yapped about the most, Twin Peaks has managed to live rent-free in my head ever since I first saw it back in 2020. Which is a testament to it, considering I haven't watched it since my second watch through back in 2021. Everything from the incredibly memorable cast of characters to the amazing score by Angelo Badalamenti grabbed me and never let go. But it wasn't until this year, when the coldness of winter started to roll in, that I decided to return to the world of Twin Peaks. Not only to relive it for myself, but so I can then share my thoughts with all of you lovely people. And I'll be doing that the only way I know how, organising every episode into a nice little list from worst to best. That includes the original series, the movie Fire Walk With Me, and The Return, aka Season 3. Fire Walk With Me obviously isn't an episode, but it's so crucial to the overall story that I can't ignore it. I'll be sure to touch on all the amazing aspects of this show along the way, and point out some of the not so good parts as well. I'll also single out my favourite Dale Cooper quote from each episode, because that man is just an endless fountain of memorable dialogue. I'll try to give my interpretations on what all the shit in this show means, but take it with a grain of salt because this is just one guy's opinion. And I think it goes without saying that this video will be riddled with spoilers. So with all that out of the way, welcome to every Twin Peaks episode ranked. Number 49, The Condemned Woman. Starting off this list is going to be a whole bunch of episodes from Season 2, and if you've ever watched this show, it's pretty obvious where I'm going with this. Season 2 is notorious for taking a nosediving quality after the reveal and resolution of who killed Laura Palmer, less than halfway through its 22 episodes. It's pretty common knowledge these days that the apes running ABC at the time pressured David Lynch and Mark Frost into solving the mystery, even though it wasn't really the original intention to ever reveal it, or at least not until the end of the show. Because who would want to watch the series after it solved the mystery that the entire show was built around? It turns out no one did, and the ratings nosedived almost as rapidly as the quality of the writing. But for me at least, it's honestly not all as bad as everyone says it is. Obviously, this stretch of Season 2 doesn't even touch the earlier episodes, but there's still a lot of fun to be had with many of the plot lines. It basically amps up the more zany and comedic stuff that's been in the show since the beginning, perhaps to an annoying degree. I've also got some major soft spots for Benjamin's Civil War plot, and the little Nicky conspiracy with Andy and Dick. When I was re-watching this time around, I honestly wasn't sure if any episode would jump out at me as the worst, since they all seemed to be pretty fine, and then I got to episode 16. This is definitely my least favourite episode of the show, and the only one I would really call bad. My main reason for this is that it's heavily focused on the Josie Packard plotline, which I'm going to get this out of the way right now, is my least favourite plotline across the whole series, ever since the first couple episodes. Josie is just not at all an engaging character to me, and she doesn't really have any quirks that make her stand out like so many of the other characters do. The characters that surround her storyline for the most part are fun, especially Pete who consistently puts out the greatest line ratings in history, Grand Theft Auto. But pretty much all the new ones introduced throughout Season 2 are duds, mainly Thomas Eckert and Andrew Packard, although he does have some amusing moments with Pete. They also chose to pair Josie with Harry Truman romantically. I don't know if this is a hot take or not, but Harry's probably another of my least favourite characters, mainly because he doesn't really stand out in any way. This is probably on purpose since with so many zany characters they needed someone to be the straight man, and he fills that role quite well, but as a result, I just never fully clicked with him. I do like his camaraderie with Coop and the rest of the sheriff's department, but on his own, there isn't much for me to latch onto. So anytime there's a scene of the two of them sharing the screen, I'm just waiting for it to end so we can get back to something more interesting. Anyways, I've rambled on for long enough. I should probably talk about the actual episode. The majority of the runtime is dedicated to resolving the Josie plotline, and I do think there's a pretty good sense of dread and inevitability built up throughout the episode, and it really hammers home just how fucked the titular condemned woman is. She finds out Andrew is alive, Catherine trolls her into meeting with Eckert and gives her a gun to deal with him, Albert's trying to get Coop to arrest her since he has clear evidence she's the one who shot him, and Harry's also finally closing in on her after being goaded by Hank. There's also this shot that mirrors her introduction back in a pilot, which is pretty cool. All this culminates in Josie shooting Eckert dead, and then when she's confronted by Cooper and Harry, she suddenly dies and turns into a doorknob. This honestly might take the cake for the most random and weird moment in all of Twin Peaks, definitely the original series at least. Bob and the Armbo show up to taunt Coop after she dies, so it seems clear that her death was definitely Black Lodge influenced. 
but unlike other weird scenes throughout the show, I never really got the urge to speculate on it because I just didn't care about Josie to begin with. The main thrust of Cooper's storyline this season, that being Windermill's chess game, is also put on the back burner to accommodate the Josie plot. This episode also wraps up a couple of other long-running plot lines. James and Donna meet up to get their relationship back on track after that little sideshow he had for the last five or so episodes, but even though she went to all the trouble of setting up this lovely picnic, he just wants to leave and see the world or whatever. So this is basically them breaking up. They both seem pretty chill about it though, so it's all good. And that's the last we see of James for the rest of the original series, which honestly feels pretty anticlimactic, and kind of makes that whole side plot of his even more pointless. He left Twin Peaks to get away from it all and got mixed up in the Evelyn plot, and after all that, he still just wants to leave Twin Peaks and get away from it all. This is also the last time we see Hank, when Norma shows up to finally end their relationship, and he cries about it like a big baby, and then probably ends up getting shanked in prison soon after. It's good seeing Hank finally get some sort of comeuppance after all the tomfoolery he caused ever since he got out of prison, and it's extra satisfying to see Norma standing up to him at last. Her leaving Hank is conveniently timed with Nadine breaking up with Ed, since she's more interested in boning Mike these days. We were introduced to everyone's favourite character John Justice Wheeler, played by the one and only Billy Zane. The consensus on this guy doesn't seem to be too hot, since it's not exactly subtle that he's only here to give Audrey a new love interest, since Cooper apparently doesn't get down with high schoolers. I think as a character he's pretty amusing, and Zane definitely helps sell his charmingness, but I don't think he's going to be taking home any favourite character prizes. Audrey is clearly starstruck from the moment she meets him, but decides to go with a classic be a dick to get them to like you method of Riz. Jack's here to help Benjamin out with the first step of his new redemption arc, the Stop Ghostwood protest. Apparently being in the Civil War made Ben have a self-discovery moment, and now he's determined to right all the wrongs he's caused throughout the series, starting with saving the beloved Pine Weasels. The best Dale Cooper quote this episode goes to... Earl has a perverse sense of honour about these things. Number 48. Dispute Between Brothers. This is the first episode after the wrap-up of the Laura Palmer mystery, and it's kind of amazing how the show instantly falls off. Most of the lame stuff in this episode was already going on before, whether it be Nadine's high schooler arc or Bobby's being a dick to Shelley arc. But those used to be side pieces next to an actually engaging story. But now that it's over, the writers didn't really come up with anything worthwhile to fill that void. Cooper's on his grand farewell tour before apparently leaving Twin Peaks for good, attending the eventful funeral of Leland, touching base with Audrey where he trauma dumps about the previous love of his life, which obviously becomes important later on, and finally making the rounds of a sheriff's station. The goodbye scene between Cooper and Truman and them with the rest of the squad is pretty emotional, and you can tell how much all the locals have come to value Dale's presence. He gets to become an official member of the Bookhouse Boys, and drops a big hint on what will be going on in the return. Deputy Hawk, if I'm ever lost, I hope you're the man they send to find me. It's all quite beautiful, until it's ruined by some FBI drongos coming in to suspend Cooper from the FBI. And that's what's going to be occupying Cooper for the next couple episodes, and it never really gets that exciting. After all the questioning and whatnot where the guy basically just says Cooper's been a naughty boy, him and Major Briggs go out for a little playdate in the woods. Major Briggs is one of those characters who is always just captivating to watch no matter what scene it is, and that's a credit to both Don Davis' acting and the way his dialogue is written. Briggs makes the first mention across the show of a white lodge, but doesn't get to elaborate because Dale has to piss. One flash of light and a spooky hour later, and the Major's gone. He seems to have a habit of disappearing in this series, whether it be kidnapped by a Windermere horse or being transported to the White Lodge, I think. On a more amusing note, the Dick and Andy rivalry is officially underway, even if Andy seems to want to just all be friends until the identity of a father is revealed. Dick is a character who I always love to see on screen, thanks in huge part to Ian Buchanan's impeccable performance. It's honestly a tragedy that he didn't get to show up in the return at all, Catherine's finally put an end to that horrendous Tojimura cosplay stint and revealed her aliveness to Truman, who seems quite unsurprised at this revelation. I'll talk more about the Tojimura thing later, but the short version is that it sucks. There's also this weird ass scene where Bobby's trying to get into Ben's office to blackmail him or whatever, and Audrey shows up to give him a hand. For this scene and a couple future episodes, there's this weird sex thing going on between them, even though I'm pretty sure they like never interacted before this, but I guess it serves Bobby's current trajectory of being a knob to Shelley. It's thankfully never brought up again after a few episodes. Vivian wins the Mother of the Year award when she reveals that the negative review of a double R written by the so-called M.T. Wentz was actually her doing, and Norma rightfully tells her to fuck off out of her life, while their husband's scheme of Jean Renault to frame Cooper with cocaine. Jean is actually a pretty intimidating villain sometimes, and I'm honestly not sure what the consensus is on Hank amongst the fandom. I've always liked him quite a bit, mainly thanks to how charismatic his actor is, and I do love a good scumbag character which the show has plenty of. 
Other stuff in this episode includes Nadine's cheerleading tryouts, Josie showing up at Harry's house looking all distressed, and Leo apparently showing signs of looseness, none of which is any good. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... There's nothing quite like urinating out in the open air. Number 47. Wounds and Scars. Harry's spending this episode drinking away his sorrows after Josie's doorknob incident, and it's up to the rest of the sheriff's department to pick up the slack, and to save Harry from drinking himself into an early grave. The episode opens on this absolutely hilarious montage of Truman and Josie's makeout sessions throughout the show, while seductive jazz music plays. Cooper's strategy to help Harry get over Josie's death is to tell him how she was an evil murdering psycho and also a hooker, which shockingly doesn't seem to work very well. Get out of here! Go! Anytime Michael Onkane does an angry Harry performance, I just can't take it seriously. Probably because throughout the show, the only emotions he usually shows are default or horny as fuck. His next scene where he's confronted by the bookhouse boys after tearing the house apart Chuck McGill style is a lot better though, and I do feel for him when he breaks down in Cooper's arms. Probably one of Harry's best scenes. On a brighter note, Annie Blackburn arrives in town to steal the hearts of both Cooper and the audience. From what I can gather, most of the fandom isn't too hot on Annie, since much like Billy Zane, she seems to only be here to give Cooper a new love interest, since Audrey's off the table. But unlike Mr. Justice Wheeler, Annie is actually pretty important to the plot, with her kidnapping by Winder Merle later on giving Cooper some more personal motivation to follow them into the Black Lodge. Plus I just think she's a fun character, and she stands out as being more down to earth among all the other quirky folks around her, and Heather Graham is rather mesmerizing. Winder Merle is up to all sorts of hijinks this episode, after he gets mad at Dale for apparently cheating the chess game using Pete's world-class skills. He then shows up to Donna's house wearing one of his patented disguises, this time posing as an old friend of her dad's. Donna seems to have no problem letting this weird guy into her house. Maybe she's trying to find a new guy after James rode off into the sunset. Apparently this guy Wyndham's posing as died ages ago, and he leaves a gift showing his next move against Cooper. Not sure what the point of his little visit was if he was just going to post his chess move, in the process exposing his physical appearance to someone, but whatever. He also shows up at the double R in another awesome disguise to watch Cooper play the moves on Annie, and to creepily encourage Shelley to enter the Miss Twin Peaks pageant. The other plot point featuring Donna is the new development of some sort of relation between Ben Horn and her mum, which turns into a little plotline that reeks of, we gotta give Donna some material for these last few episodes so she's not just standing around. I'll lead up anything that features Benjamin though. Speaking of Ben, the great Save the Pine Weasel plot is underway, and Catherine shows up at this fashion show thing to try and figure out his angle. Turns out Ben really has grown, and just wants to do some good for a change, but Kathy doesn't buy it. I've always loved Ben's corrupt side, but this new reformed version of him is just as fun to watch. Dick's hosting the fashion show when the fabled Pine Weasel is brought out, and things quickly go haywire after it gets a whiff of his cologne, and Audrey and Justice take the chance to start getting it on. Every episode I did was great fun. I loved all the people that I worked with, but I think one that stands out was probably the fashion show, and because I got to work with David Lander, who I loved. He was playing Mr. Pinkle, and he brought the Pine Weasel, which the, we were doing a fundraiser for. That was definitely a lot of fun. Of course, it led into the wine tasting, and I had the bandage on my nose. Yeah, I was everybody there for wine tasting. Also, some of the lines from the fashion show were great. Like, you know, we, here we have uh, Andy and a plethora of plaid, which I particularly loved and have used frequently ever since. There's some good mystery building with Margaret discovering Major Briggs having a similar tattoo thing to her, which was also the result of a flashing light and owls. The Log Lady is one of those characters who we never got enough of, so we gotta save her every scene that she does have. Thomas Eckert's assistant lady pulls up at Catherine's to give her the mystery box that'll be fueling the rest of her plotline, and then goes to Harry's to get in bed with him, and when I was watching this scene I completely forgot who this chick was, so I had no idea what was going on. It doesn't really matter because she's quickly dispatched at the start of the next episode. I quite like this episode overall, mainly thanks to how silly most of it is, particularly the pine weasel hijinks and Wyndham's ridiculous disguises, which only get better as the show progresses. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... Man who doesn't love easily, loves too much. Number 46. Slaves and Masters. This is the lowest rated episode of the whole show on both IMDb and Serialized, and while I don't personally agree, I could see why. A lot of this episode is dedicated to wrapping up both Ben Horn's Civil War plot and the James Hurley Evelyn Marsh plot, both of which are often called the worst storylines in the show. As for my thoughts, I guess this is another hot take because I love the Civil War plot, mainly because it's just an excuse to give us more Ben Horn being a goofball. It does have some problematic imagery, 
but seeing Audrey and the gang acting out the war to get Ben through it is highly amusing, and it ends with him thinking it was all a dream and beginning his new arc as a changed man. As for the James plot, I've seen the show three times now, but this was actually my first time watching through the whole thing, since previously I would skip through the James plot because that's what everyone told me to do, so I was going into it this time expecting the worst, and it honestly is not that bad. If you already don't like James, then I will admit this storyline won't do anything to change your mind, but as someone who doesn't mind him, I found the majority of this plot just fine. I'll take it over Josie and Harry's Starcross lovers crap at least. Basically, Evelyn set James up and he's mad about it, but this guy gets the jump on him, and then Donna runs in, and then Evelyn shoots that guy instead of James. It's all not very interesting, but it's at least entertaining. In terms of actually good stuff, Albert returns to lend a hand with developing Wyndham Earl case, and I love this new best friend's energy he's got going on with Harry. Albert's gotta be in my top three favourite characters, and even in this period of lesser quality, he still manages to constantly deliver top tier dialogue, including this line that's yes, one of my favourites. Replacing the quiet elegance of the dark suit and tie with the casual indifference of these muted earth tones is a form of fashion suicide, but uh, call me crazy. I knew it works. Another great addition of a chess squad is Pete, who apparently is a chess god who could probably beat Magnus Carlsen with his eyes closed. More Pete is never a bad thing, so I'll buy him being a chess pro if it means we get more of him. Meanwhile, Wyndham himself fucks around with Leo and doesn't really do anything important. Ed and Norma are finally getting ready to start their new lives together, now that Nadine is a deranged high schooler who's obsessed with Mike. Nadine shows up while they're in bed and seems pretty chill with it, so I'm sure it's going to be smooth sailing from here. The Nadine-Ed love story is so stretched out throughout the series that it's kind of depressing, especially when you get to the return. The Josie plot continues to bore the hell out of me, but thankfully it doesn't take up too much of a runtime. So yeah, I get why this is most people's least favourite episode, but there's enough fun wacky stuff to elevate it above the previous ones in my eyes. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to Great players are either far or few. Number 45. Masked Ball. This one is all about setting up the new plot lines that will be stuck with for the next five or so episodes. The best new offering here is easily the introduction of Denise Bryson from the DEA, here to investigate the allegations made against Cooper. Denise is far and away my favourite new character introduced during this season, and I wish she stuck around for longer than a couple episodes. I can't speak for how well she's represented as a trans character, but just at face value she's really fun to watch and is a good addition of a Cooper plot. Hawk doesn't seem to approve though. She shows up while Hawk's telling us about the White Lodge and the Black Lodge. Probably the best thing the back half of season 2 did was introduce all this lore around the lodges, and it goes on to play a huge part in both the end of this season as well as in Firewalk With Me and The Return. Betty seems pretty chill about the fact that the Major went missing in a flash of light, and doesn't really seem keen on helping Coop and Truman with figuring out what the hell happened to him. The infamous James plot begins, and like I said before it honestly is not that bad. Evelyn Marsh is pretty much a plot device character who's there solely to give James another bad bitch to smooch, and she serves her purpose just fine. It's still near the bottom when compared to the rest of the plot lines, but it could be worse. On the opposite end of the spectrum, the peak storyline known as the Little Nicky conspiracy gets going, when Dick shows up with him to show off how much he's invested in caring for children ahead of Lucy's impending pregnancy. Nicky starts to reveal his devilish tendencies by trolling both Uncle Andy and Uncle Dick of a double R. The Little Nicky plot is a prime example of a comedic goal that's found all throughout season 2. Unfortunately, one plotline that doesn't hit the mark for me is Nadine's high schooler arc, which is steadily progressing throughout this episode. There's plenty of it that I do like, mainly whenever she's interacting with Big Ed, and the scene with Donna is also pretty funny, but on the whole it's a bit of a dud. Ben's not having a very good time after the whole getting arrested for murder and Ben losing Ghostwood thing, so he's taken to staying inside and watching Instagram reels like the rest of us. Hank shows up to rub it in by adding that he doesn't own One-Eyed Jacks anymore, and he's quit working for him. How much of a hot take would it be for me to say that Ben is my favourite character in Season 2? Seeing him completely fall apart after the Laura debacle, and then work his way back up throughout the season, is a pretty satisfying character arc for him, since he was pretty much just an evil rich guy in Season 1. Plus I just love Richard Beamer's portrayal of him. Other wacky hijinks happening this episode include the wedding between Dougie Milford and Miss Chickalana, who will keep showing up throughout the rest of the season to make every male character fall head over heels for her. There's also the introduction of a not-so-dead Andrew Packard to the Jersey plot, and his presence does improve the story ever so slightly, if only for his interactions with Pete. The best Dale Cooper quote of the episode goes to... Marry in haste, repent in leisure. Number 44. Double play. This episode is fucking bonkers, with a whole lot going on. The headliner here is the Windermill plot, which is finally starting up for real. 
Cooper and the gang investigate this dead guy they found at the end of the last episode, and Cooper immediately knows that it's the work of Wyndham. Not just because of the chessboard that's sitting there, but the way that the guy was killed as well. In another scene we learn about Cooper and Wyndham's history, how he could never beat him at chess, and how he probably killed his own wife, who also happened to be Dale's lover. Cooper does a good job hyping up how badass Wyndham Earl is, to the point that he's doing tricks on it. We'll see if he lives up to the hype. The whole chess game thing is a cute framing device that gives his plotline some structure, but it ultimately becomes kind of played out and pointless when Wyndham just starts doing shit anyway. Shelley's in the middle of a horror movie scene with Leo, who's decided that he's had enough of being a vegetable. Leo's one of those villains who can be pretty intimidating, but most of the time he just comes across as laughable, especially when Bobby shows up to save the day and he hobbles away into the night crying like a baby. It seems Leo can't catch a break from people maiming him at the last minute. At the end of the episode, he stumbles across Wyndham Earl's random Blair Witch lair in the middle of the woods, and from that moment on, he's just gonna be a slave. I like this scene at the sheriff station where the squad is updated on all the shit that went down the previous day, including Hank apparently being hit by a bus. Major Briggs also shows up at the station to explain where the hell he went when he disappeared. He thinks he was taken to the White Lodge, which depending on your interpretation of later events, may or may not be a place he returns to. He also drops the hardest exit dialogue ever. Until that time, I will be in the shadows if you need me. Continuing the trend of ludicrous shit happening, the mayor Dwayne shows up with a shotgun to take care of Lana, since he's convinced she murdered his brother. The cops decide the best way to deal with this is to put the two of them in a room together, and instead of her being blown to bits by shotgun shells, they end up deciding to adopt a child. No comment on that scene. This episode also sadly marks the conclusion of the Little Nicky conspiracy, after Andy tries to convince Lucy that Nicky murdered his parents. She gets Doc Hayward to come and give him and Dick an intervention, and confirm that little Nicky is in fact not the spawn of Satan, and in fact his adopted parents tragically died in a car crash. Still no proof that little Nicky's satanic influence didn't have anything to do with it though. The James plot reaches some kind of climax, with Evelyn admitting she was setting him up even though she loves him or whatever. I honestly have nothing to say about this plot at this point, it just exists. And as usual, the Packet Martell plot continues to wow and amaze. The best Al Cooper quote of the episode goes to Wyndham Earl's mind is like a diamond. It's cold and hard and brilliant. Number 43. The Black Widow. This one's a bit of a chill out episode before we get into the more substantial stuff going on in the second half of the season. Bobby's still trying to get a job with Ben Horn, and he gets his wish when Ben sends him to snoop on Hank. There's also another embarrassing scene of him trying to play the moves on Audrey, completely disregarding that he has a 10 out of 10 waiting for him at home. Bobby's character really kind of fell off a cliff this season, but he does get a good scene later on in this episode with his mum, where he brings up that amazing scene he had with his dad at the start of the season. They're interrupted by Garland suddenly showing up wearing a pilot outfit and wanting an alcoholic beverage, something we can all relate to. Cooper's plot this episode is him looking for Twin Peaks real estate, which is probably the least exciting thing he gets up to throughout the whole series, but it's still a good watch thanks to Carl McLaughlin. He takes an interest in the ominous dead dog farm, which coincidentally leads him to discover that some bad guys had a meeting there. Probably wasn't a good idea for them to meet at the most evil sounding place in town, but whatever. The scene where Audrey meets Denise is really cool, and it makes her super flustered. They have women agents? More or less. With this new info, Denise corners this schmuck and forces him to set up a drug bust, which will go down next episode. This dude's a whole lot of fun. I like how much of a pansy he is whenever the cops try to get him to do anything, whether it be making a phone call or wearing a wire. Josie's having a great time working as Catherine's maid, and although Pete does suggest that Kathy's going too hard on her, he seems pretty chill with her just being degraded like that. The James plot doesn't really go anywhere this time beyond a couple of smooches between him and Evelyn, and some other guy trying to manipulate him. Nadine's high school shenanigans continue, this time with her wrestling Mike while trying to get him to go out with her, but he doesn't seem to rock with it, and Donna isn't interested in trying to help him. The best part of a Nadine plot is easily all the other characters' reactions to it. You also get this fascinating scene of all the men of Twin Peaks slobbering all over Lana while Lucy watches thoroughly unimpressed. And lastly, the little Nicky plot continues to be the peak of fiction, this time with him fucking around with Uncle Dick while he tries to fix a car tire. The absolute best part of his plotline and the episode, though, is when Dick confronts Andy with his theory about little Nicky being the devil, and Andy having a vision of what that would look like. The best Dale Cooper quote of the episode goes to... Meanwhile, I've spent the past two days without badge and gun the best way I know how. Occupying both body and spirit. Number 42. Checkmate. Building off of last episode, this one takes the plot threads that were set up and runs with them, mostly to good effect. After Major Briggs' reappearance last episode, Cooper and Truman grill him on what he was up to. 
he of course remembers nothing and now has a cool tattoo on his neck. Right when he's finally about to tell us what the hell is going on, he's whisked away by government dudes. But most exciting stuff going on this episode is everything involving the drug bust. First off, this guy has to call up and organize a time, and like I said before, I love seeing him being a big baby over having to do all this. Then when they're getting ready for the bust, Cooper's sad because since he's not currently FBI, he can't participate. But Harry fixes this by deputizing him. Then Denise shows up, and this look for her is not it. The bust doesn't exactly go as planned, and Cooper ends up having to train himself for Denise and the other guy, and now we're in a classic hostage situation. This scene is really good, with Cooper trying to reason with Jean, and he seems to agree his only option is to surrender, but seems chill with dying if it means he gets to nail Cooper. Things start to get pretty ridiculous when Denise shows up posing as a cute food deliverer, and for some reason Jean lets her in as if it isn't incredibly sus. Anyways, Jean goes down as you would expect. Pretty funny end for this character who never really amounted to more than a kinda silly villain. Ed and Norma are up to some saucy stuff, with Ed slipping her a little note saying she's DTF, and Norma does a really bad job at hiding where she's going when she takes off. After they get the job done and she leaves, Hank shows up to quote Game of Thrones and push Ed out the tower. Oh Ed, the things we do for love. The things I do for love. <laughs> but the bus known as Nadine comes to the rescue and beats him to death. I like seeing Hank get his shit rocked, and the fact that it's by Nadine is the cherry on top. The little Nikki conspiracy continues to unfold, this time with Dick and Andy hitting up the orphanage to find out Nikki's origins. This is probably the funniest scene across the whole subplot, mainly when a couple comes in and Dick has to make some shit up. Uh, little Donnie is... dead. Hey! Dead tired, I mean. I also love Dick's detective outfit he's got going on. James and Evelyn finally get their freak on after a couple episodes of beating around the bush, and this guy seems pretty turned on by it. The episode ends on a double cliffhanger of Leo becoming comatose and going after Shelley, which is dampened a bit by him looking completely ridiculous, and the sheriff squad discovering Wyndham Earl's new move. Number 41. Laura's Secret Diary. Time for our first episode pre-season 2 fall off. In the midst of all the exciting stuff happening in early season 2, this one stands out as being particularly not as good. Starting off strong though, we have Leland being questioned about the murder of Jacques Renault. I'll get plenty of chances to talk about Ray Wise's incredible performance as Leland, so let's just say that he's exceptional in this scene and move on. Continuing with the good stuff, Andy is tasked by Doc Hayward to jack off into a cup so he can check if his sperms are good, and he gets busted by Lucy on the way to the bathroom, so now she thinks he's a huge perv. Then when Andy's throwing it back, Cooper notices he's wearing the same kind of shoes that they found a few episodes ago, and that they're from the one-armed man. This scene where Cooper gets Lucy to open up about what's going on with her and Andy is funny as hell, with Andy just waiting outside while she airs her grievances, which definitely seem like major deal breakers in a relationship. He never exercises, he never washes his car, and he doesn't even own a sports coat! Kyle McLaughlin has some great lines as well. Are you still seeing this uh, dick? On a less exciting note, one of the side plots for this episode is the rumour that a famous food critic, M.T. Wentz, is in town, so Norma and Hank are trying to spruce up the double R in anticipation of his arrival. This one is giving major filler vibes, which would be fine if it was entertaining, except it's not. And it also intersects with the arrival of the worst part of the entire show, Mr. Tojimura, aka Catherine Martell in some racist makeup. I have no idea what the writers were thinking with this one, and I was surprised when I was rewatching and this plot thread came in so early. My brain must have lumped it in with the rest of the dumb stuff from the back half of season 2, but here it is, right in the midst of the Laura Palmer mystery. All these scenes are just painful to watch, and the payoff is just Catherine being reintroduced to the show. Not a fan. Ben discovers Audrey's being held hostage at One-Eyed Jack's, and enlists Cooper to help her get out of there, and Cooper enlists Harry to get the best of the Bookhouse boys to give him a hand. Turns out Harry considers himself the best. Cooper and Harry's growing friendship throughout the show is great to watch, and it's a shame they didn't get to reunite him at return. Then we got Harold Smith continuing to be the creepiest guy ever, and Donna's just lapping it up. Not sure how old this fucker is supposed to be, but even disregarding that, I'm just not rocking with his vibe at all. He wants Donna to give him her secrets because he just loves those apparently. Plus he won't let her read Laura's secret diary. Major red flags all around. Josie returns from Seattle or wherever she is, so that her stupid plotline can start getting screen time again, which is great news for me. Not much else to this episode honestly, has some really fun scenes but overall kinda lame. The best Al Cooper quote of the episode goes to... Heaven is a large and interesting place, sir. Number 40. The Path to the Black Lodge. All the episodes we just covered minus episode 4 are what I'm calling the bad part of season 2, relative to the rest of the show. 
I think I made it clear that most of them weren't really that bad, but obviously they pale in comparison to the rest of the show. Everyone has a different opinion on when exactly the bad part of a show starts and ends, but for me it's episode 10 through to 17. 18 onwards is back to good stuff, and I'll talk more about that later. This episode, as the name implies, is mostly about laying the groundwork for the finale. Both the Cooper gang and Wyndham Merle are trying to figure out how to get to the Black Lodge, Wyndham for nefarious reasons, and Cooper just because Wyndham is. We get a lot more cool lore about the Lodge from Major Briggs, who's here to help and give more insight into Earl's past. Earl was the best and brightest among us. And then he decides to go for a stroll in the woods alone, and no one thinks that maybe they should have someone with him, because the last time he was in the woods alone, things didn't go so well. And what do you know, Briggs disappears again, thanks to the peak of Windermill's increasingly ridiculous disguises. I can't tell if I hate the scene or love it. It does lead to this cool part where Wyndham's got him on the wall and trolling him with a crossbow, and we get another Garland one-liner for the ages. What do you fear most in the world? The possibility that love is not enough. This episode also starts some sort of quasi-redemption arc for Leo, or at least for inklings of one. Wyndham's going on about his grand plan to murder whichever lovely lady wins the Miss Twin Peaks pageant, and when he mentions Shelley, Leo gets all mad and shocks himself. Even though he seemed chill with trying to murder her multiple times in the past, including trapping her in a burning building. Definitely an interesting development for his character, but it doesn't really pay off beyond him freeing the Major later on. The writers are trying to get Bobby's character back on track after he spent most of his season just being a dick to Shelley, so he finally apologizes for being a mophead and whatnot. After he saw Gordon laying the moves on her, I guess he realized how hard he was fumbling. Cooper spends most of the episode talking about how down bad he is for Annie, and there's this pretty interesting scene where the two of them are doing their usual sweet talk, but the camera just keeps pulling out slowly throughout the entire conversation, definitely giving the vibe that this cute little romance probably isn't going to end well. Coop also keeps bringing up how cool love is to Harry, which seems pretty cavalier considering like three episodes ago he was drinking himself to death after his own lover turned into a doorknob. Continuing the trend of everyone in town being a horn dog, John Justice Wheeler suddenly has to leave town because his business partner's been murdered, and since Audrey's still in Seattle doing protest stuff, he really, really doesn't want to go yet. The two of them spend the whole episode barely missing each other, but eventually she finds out he's at the airport, so she recruits Pete, who just happens to be there doing whatever he does, to get over there ASAP. I really don't mind the idea of giving Audrey a non-Cooper love interest, and like I said before, I think Wheeler's a pretty cool dude, but the problem with both this relationship and Cooper's with Annie is that its speed ran way too quickly in just a few episodes. Both of them seem to just instantly fall for each other, even if there is a bit of beating around the bush before they fully confess their undying love. And then he's just shipped off out of a story just as quickly as he showed up, leaving Audrey to have nothing to do in the last two episodes other than chain herself to a bank vault and get blowed up. <laughs> I feel like introducing both Jack and Annie earlier in the season would have not only given the writers more time to actually explore these relationships, but also give Audrey some more material beyond helping her dad get through the Civil War. Anyways, Pete drives Audrey over to Jack's plane right when it's taking off, she tells him she's a virgin, and then they go inside to smoosh booties while Pete just waits I guess. Probably just wondering what the hell is going on. There's also this thing going on in this episode where characters' hands start shaking, not really sure what's up with that. The best part is definitely the ending though, where we get to see the entrance of a black lodge, Bob coming out of it, and then that awesome last part where we see the curtains in the water and that red room music creeping in. Definitely got me hyped for the last two episodes. And the best Al Cooper quote of the episode goes to... He has engaged us in subterfuge and red herring. A fish I don't particularly care for. Number 39. Miss Twin Peaks. Alright, I promise I'm almost done talking about season 2. This episode aired back to back with what at the time was the last ever Twin Peaks episode. Ben's path to redemption seems to be going well, since he comforts Audrey after Jack raw dogged her and fled the country, but he ruins the moment by basically forcing her to enter the Miss Twin Peaks contest, since he thinks it'll improve the horn reputation or something. Donna's trying to get her parents to tell her the truth about whatever's going on with them and Benjamin, but they still won't budge. She manages to get it from Ben himself though, the big revelation being that he's her father. I don't know about you guys, but I saw this one coming a mile away, and I'm still wondering why this plot point was even needed. Doesn't Ben have enough shady shit in his past going on as is? Did we need to add a secret door to cover up on top? The long simmering love triangle between Andy, Dick, and Lucy comes to an unceremonial end when she announces that Andy will be the father, and Richard doesn't seem to be too disappointed. This is his last appearance in the show, and he will be sorely missed. Most of the stuff surrounding the pageant is dedicated to making it as obvious as possible that Annie is going to tragically be declared the winner, and thus the target of Wyndham's grand plan. 
Her and Cooper start boning. Norma says she wants to see a double R representative winning. Cooper mentions to Diane that he feels the same way for Annie that he did for Carolyn, etc. There's also this one scene where Wyndham looks like a demon for some reason. Not sure what's up with that. Cooper and the squad's theorizing of a Black Lodge leads them to the idea that fear is the key to entering, and of course Wyndham gets wind of this because he's got a bug in the bonsai in the room. Maybe it's just me, but I would have found the delivery of his bonsai pretty sus, but no one seemed to care about it so now Wyndham's way ahead of him. Thankfully Andy being the silly goofball that he is, knocks it over and reveals the bug, so now it's all hands on deck of the pageant. There's also this ongoing thing where Andy's trying to tell Cooper something, but he keeps ignoring him because he's just a dick I guess. The Miss Twin Peaks pageant goes just about how you would expect. I'm not really convinced that Annie's speech was good enough to win over Dick instead of Lana's seduction skills, but it's what had to happen for the plot. Cooper and the squad for some reason don't immediately make a beeline for Annie as soon as she announces the winner, and instead just stand around while Wyndham and Log Lady cosplay fuck shit up and kidnaps her. This whole scene is appropriately disorienting thanks to the strobe lights, and it really enhances the fear factor. Nadine also has a sandbag fall on her head. Andy finally gets to tell Coop what was on his mind, which is that the petroglyph is a map. Pretty underwhelming if you ask me. All really good setup for the final episode, even if it did end up being pretty predictable. The best Al Cooper quote of the episode goes to... What? Number 38. My log has a message for you. It's finally time to talk about The Return. I don't even know where to start on this one. The Return is 18 hours of pure David Lynch Mark Frost perfection, and it might just be humanity's greatest achievement. Breaking down the episodes on an individual level is going to be a bit harder, because they really do flow together like one incredibly long movie, to the point that a lot of people have adamantly declared it as a movie, and not a TV show. I don't agree with those people, but I can definitely see their reasoning. The first two parts of a return were originally released on the same day and treated as one big premiere, so this first episode feels lacking in a way the others don't. Not to say it's bad or anything, because it definitely isn't. In fact, coming back to The Return after not having watched it in a few years, I was actually surprised at just how good it was from the get-go, since I remember it taking a few episodes for me to really get into it the first time. This episode is focused on introducing us to just a couple of the many, many different plotlines that are going to be going on in this season, and as such I can feel a bit disjointed, especially the first time watching. We go from Dr. Jacoby getting shovels delivered, to this guy watching an empty box, Ben Horn in his office, etc. It's a lot to take in, but as the show progresses it all starts to make sense. The start of the episode brings us back to the end of season 2 with Laura telling us to wait 25 years, and let me just say up front that I watched the show after the return had finished airing, and as such I didn't get the ultimate experience of waiting 25 years like many people did. But even as someone who didn't have to wait at all, when the intro music starts up again after the cold open it still managed to get me excited. I miss the bird from the original intro, and I do wish it was a bit longer so we got to hear more of a theme, but I'm just glad the intro's still here. One of the main things going on this episode is this guy watching this glass box, which doesn't show anything until he starts getting down with his hot chick who brings him coffee. So I'm assuming the entity that mutilates them is Judy, and this box somehow facilitates travel between the Black Lodge and our world. Maybe it's supposed to trap anything that tries to get into our world, but it only works if someone's actually watching it. Let's talk about the coolest character introduction ever, featuring Evil Cooper or Mr. C or whatever you want to call him. This whole first scene with him sets the tone for his character perfectly, the way he just struts in, easily takes out this guy and gets what he needs really gets the point across that this guy cannot be messed with. The first shot of a road gives extreme Lost Highway vibes, and the music really sets the mood. Kyle MacLachlan was firing on all cylinders this season portraying like 3 or 4 different characters, but his performance as Evil Coop is easily his best work in my opinion. I love how he basically never raises his voice or shows any kind of emotion beyond cool and collected, and every second that he's on screen has me locked in 100%. The main overarching mystery of the series begins in this episode, not in Twin Peaks where you would expect, but in South Dakota. The cops discover this fucked up body with its head separated. The head is Ruth Davenport's and the body's a mystery. The coroner Constance Talbot is one of my many favourite new characters in Return. She isn't in it much, but she's super funny. Cause of death. Took me a while, but I think someone cut this man's head off. In fact, going into the return, I was obviously excited to see all the characters from the original series, but the new cast honestly stole the show. I'll get to all of them as I cover the other episodes, but it's definitely one of the aspects of the return that I was most impressed with. Speaking of new characters, it turns out that the guy responsible for the murder was Bill Hastings, played by none other than Matthew Lillard. Another fantastic performance that manages to stick out in this huge cast. But if I dwelled on every single good performance in this show, which is all of them, we'd be here all day and this video is already way too long. The Twin Peaks side of the story starts up when Margaret calls up Hawk to give him some cryptic clue about how he needs to find something that relates to Cooper and his heritage. 
I love that Hawk has such a substantial role in the return. He was already cool as hell in the original series, and now he pretty much gets to take charge of this side of the story. Andy and Lucy are pretty much the same as ever, except Andy's packed on a few pounds and his hairstyle has become even more ridiculous. So the return's off to a great start, but I did end up putting this episode at the bottom because it's really just laying the groundwork for the rest of the season, and a lot of the best plot lines don't even start until a few episodes later. The best oh, Cooper yeah. quote of the episode goes to... Beulah. Put something better at your front door. Number 37. Variations and Relations. Alright, back to season 2. We're deep in the Windermill investigation this episode, with most of the screen time being dedicated to it, which is a good thing. The Sheriff Squad finds out Wyndham's already discovered this petroglyph in our cave, basically a big diagram of a bunch of seemingly random drawings. No one can figure out what all of it means, and it's going to stay that way for a couple episodes. Meanwhile, Wyndham's having a fun time at home with Leo and this guy he's got in his big chess pawn, and we get some cool info on the difference between the White Lodge and the Black Lodge. Obviously, Wyndham isn't too fond of the White Lodge because it's all nice and stuff. My thoughts on Wyndham Earl are kinda all over the place. I think his actor does a good job hamming up the silliness while still being intimidating, but the way he's written just leaves something to be desired. His disguises might be a step too far in the silly factor. The puzzle box saga begins here, with Pete saying it could take years to figure it out. Turns out all you really need to do is just drop it and shoot it a bunch. Another addition to the comedic gold of Dick Tremaine scenes is the wine tasting, which has Lucy and Andy in attendance for some reason. The funniest parts of this scene are every time Dick mentions Andy. Let us first examine- Don't taste it yet, Andy, for heaven's sake. Spit it out! And when Lucy confidently guesses the flavour of a wine and is shut down. Tastes kind of woody. No, not really. Anyone else? Cooper and Annie's relationship starts to evolve when he asks her to accompany him on a nature study, aka sitting in a boat talking about past trauma. It seems to get the job done though. The obvious highlight of this episode is Gordon Cole and Shelley's scene, where he gets to smooch her before he leaves Twin Peaks. I'll talk more about this dynamic soon, but the two scenes we get of Gordon and Shelley are among the funniest in the whole show. What the hell's going on? You are witnessing a front three-quarter view of two adults sharing a tender moment. Uh, Gordon? Take another look, Sonny. It's going to happen again. Every line out of David Lynch's mouth is pure gold, especially this one which may as well be the logline for the show. This world of Twin Peaks seems to be filled with beautiful women. There's also the scene of Cooper and Jack, which is really good for no reason. This is the only time these two interact, to chat about the beautiful women in their lives, and I do love a cheesy scene like this. The rest of the episode is mostly people trying to convince all the women in the show to enter the Miss Twin Peaks pageant, which no one seems that keen on, and we end on the gang discovering the newest in the line of increasingly ridiculous moves by Wyndham Earl. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... I've got four hungry lawmen out in a police cruiser. We need donuts. And coffee. Hot. Too black, too white, no sugars, please. Number 36. There's a body alright. This episode is a great display of how awesome the return is, and also shows how consistent it is considering an episode this good is relatively low on my list. Hawk shows Frank for pages from Laura's secret diary that he found in the bathroom stall, which has info from Firewalk with me about the dream she had of Annie and Cooper. I love how the return gives us all these new layers to the mystery that slot in with the original series and the movie perfectly. It really makes the whole series feel more cohesive. The idea that Leland hid these pages during the episode where he was questioned and they'd been sitting there for 25 years is just really cool, and for return has multiple instances of this kind of storytelling. I am curious where the last page of a diary is, and what kind of secrets it might contain, but it might not be that important if it wasn't with the other ones. Frank also calls up Doc Haywood over Skype using this incredible retractable monitor he's got installed in his desk, and the first time I saw this I legit burst out laughing. There's some filling in the gaps from after season 2, most importantly Haywood mentions he saw Cooper sneaking out of intensive care where Audrey was in a coma, which lines up with her giving birth 9 months later which is pretty disgusting to think about. Gordon and Albert recruit Diane to get her insight into Evil Coop's weirdness, and man Laura Dern is so good in this scene, and Kyle's complete lack of emotion in his performance is incredibly off-putting. Diane hints at the last night they saw each other, and you could probably guess where that's going. Finally, I get to talk about the Dougie Jones plot, which is easily the highlight of a return. Going forward, I'm going to refer to Comatose Cooper as Dougie, even though it's not actually Dougie, just for convenience sake. These detective buffoons question Dougie and Janie E about his missing car, and I love how drawn out this scene is just for them to reveal that his car exploded. 
Naomi Watts is fantastic as Janie E and is my absolute favourite new character in The Return. If you ask me, she's the soul of this show, and the way her relationship with Dougie progresses is amazing. The best part of this episode is right after that scene, when Ike the Spike comes at Dougie with a gun and gets promptly sorted out by both him and Janie E. My favourite part of this scene is the interviews with bystanders after, particularly this victim? one chick. Oh no, that guy didn't act like any victim. Douglas Jones, he moved like a cobra. All I saw was a blur. Benjamin and his assistant Beverly are investigating the strange humming noise of the Great Northern, and this is one thing that I'm completely stumped on. I have no idea what that noise is supposed to be, but I have heard some people say that it could be Josie still inhabiting the wooden walls of a hotel, which is depressingly amusing. I really like Ben's reaction when Beverly asks about Laura. Who's Laura Palmer? Oh, that, my dear, is a long story. There's also this iconic scene where a guy sweeps for 10 minutes. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to Just tell him we need to speak about a strawberry. Number 35. The Orchid's Curse. A lot of action going on this episode, mainly revolving around Donna and Maddie's diary heist at Harold Smith's, and Cooper and Harry's mission to save Audrey from One-Eyed Jacks. I'll give the edge to the diary heist, since it's more closely tied into the main plot for one thing, what with the diary being vital evidence in Laura's story, plus there's some good drama between Donna and Harold, plus I'm a big Maddie fan so having her around is a bonus. This part where Harold rakes himself with this thing is funny, and I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be taking it seriously. The Audrey rescue mission is pretty exciting, but the best part is easily when Hawk shows up to bail them out. I don't know why they were being all secretive about the mission around him when he's one of the bookhouse boys and a legend. Other than these spurts of action, not much else of note actually goes down. Leland has a bail hearing that goes pretty well, and then the fact that he murdered Jacques is never mentioned again, Bobby and Shelley fuck around with this guy, the Tojimura plot continues to make me mad, etc. The core mystery of who killed Laura is completely on the back burner, and as such this episode really feels like something right out of a bad part of season 2. Thankfully though we do get to find out that Andy's sperms are actually active, which is what really matters. I'm a whole damn town! I'm a whole damn town. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to Diana and now upside down. Number 34. Call for help. The vast majority of this episode is focused on getting Cooper out of wherever the hell he is and starting up the Dougie Jones plot. I'm gonna be real with you guys, I have no idea what's going on this entire first chunk of the episode. Cooper's in this weird void place with a purple ocean, and this eyeless chick is there who at the end of the series turns into the real Diane, so I'm assuming the whole time we see her it's actually Diane. What's a lot more straightforward though is what's going on with evil Cooper, who's driving around at the time all this weird shit's happening. We are also introduced to the real Dougie Jones, who's finishing up with Jade who just gave him a ride. So the basic rundown of what's going on is that evil Cooper created the tulpa known as Dougie in the late 90s, so that when it's time for him to go back to the Black Lodge, it'll be Dougie instead. That's all very clear cut, but what isn't clear is why Cooper is catatonic when he returns to Earth and replaces Dougie. I have two different interpretations, whether it's just 25 years of a Black Lodge messing with his brain, or what seems more likely to me is that it has something to do with the electricity fucking his brain up. After all, that machine did look pretty gnarly, and the fact that what brings him back proper is shocking himself with a wall socket makes it seem like that's what Lynch and Frost were going for. Let me know what you guys think. Throughout all of this we get to see some of a Return's trademark special effects, which are obviously crude, but they convey what they're supposed to effectively, and they're memorable, so I'm cool with it. Plus, we know the effects team can do really impressive stuff when they want to, so I'm gonna chalk this kind of stuff up to a stylistic decision. As part of Evil Coop's plan, he's got this whole network of guys set up to take down Cooper once he returns to Earth, but I guess he didn't vet them very well because they're gonna be spending the whole series trying to murk this guy and just can't get it done. We're also reintroduced to Gordon, Cole, and Albert, plus the new kid on the block, Tammy. This squad is going to be leading the charge of my second favourite plotline in the return, right behind Dougie's Odyssey. Gordon and Albert were both highlight characters in the original series, so to have them be such an integral part of return was a joy to see. Tammy's a pretty fine addition of the cast, she's mostly there so that Gordon and Albert can explain all the shit to her and us, the viewers. Plus she has some other benefits. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... Hello! Number 33, On the Wings of Love. As the title suggests, this episode is all about people rizzing each other, and it's full of some of my favourite scenes across the whole show. 
I'll cut right to the chase. Gordon Cole returns to the fold, and he instantly makes every scene he's in a thousand times more entertaining. Whether it's screaming at a plant. Banzai! Remember those old World War II movies? Banzai! Ah! Damnation! Or giving Harry advice on dealing with hangovers. Harry, the best cure I ever came across for a hangover was raw meat, and plenty of it. You break an egg on it. Add in some salted anchovies, Tabasco and Worcestershire sauce. I don't know if Gordon's reintroduction coincides with Lynch returning to the writer's room after being absent for some time, but the following episodes are significantly better than the previous ones, so it might be the case. Cooper also has a hangover recipe for Harry, which sounds fucking disgusting. You take a glass of nearly frozen, unstrained tomato juice, you plop a couple of oysters in there, you drink it down. Breathe deeply. Next, you take a mound, and I mean a mound of sweetbreads. Saute them with some chestnuts and some Canadian bacon. Finally, biscuits. Big biscuits, smothered in gravy. Now, here's where it gets tricky. You're gonna need some anchovies. <laughs> Anyways, the best scene in this episode, and maybe the entire series, is when Gordon notices Shelley Johnson at the double R. It's officially Twin Peaks canon that Shelley is so hot that her voice transcends all laws of nature and can be heard perfectly by Gordon. Several of Gordon's lines throughout this scene have become permanent fixtures in my vocabulary. That's the kind of girl to make you wish she spoke a little French. Excuse me, Coop, while I try my hand at a little counter Esperanto. I was wondering if I might trouble you for a cup of strong black coffee and in the process engage you with an anecdote of no small amusement. Also love how you can see Cooper watching in the background. The man didn't even attempt to warn Gordon that Shelley's in a relationship. Also really dig the music in this scene, but I can't find it anywhere. So if you know it, let me know in the comments. And that masterpiece is followed up with Cooper trying his hand at a bit of counter Esperanto of his own with Annie. The chemistry Kyle and Heather have is pretty special, and it's a shame they never got to reunite in a return. The other scene they have near the end of the episode is just as good. This episode is filled with these cute moments before shit hits a fan. Donna spends this episode snooping around trying to figure out what her mum's doing with Ben, which is all just a bit boring to watch thanks to how telegraphed the ultimate reveal will be. Her dad also does a very bad job at trying to cover up what's going on. Ben has a pretty nice scene with Audrey about how he's going to fix their family and whatnot, but ruins the moment by then shipping her off to Seattle before she and Wheeler can start getting down and dirty. There's some plot development stuff with the boys going to our cave to find this petroglyph, but what made this episode so memorable was all those amazing scenes of characters just hanging out and being friends. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to Turkey sandwich, whole wheat, lettuce, dollop of mayonnaise. Number 32 Coma. Both this and the season 2 opener are directed by Lynch, and you can definitely tell. Plenty of trademark Twin Peaks weirdness to be found here, whether it's Donna's Meals on Wheels adventure bringing her to this chick in a mini David Lynch, or Bob doing his thing in the Palmer house. Mrs. Tremond and Miss Kidd are two characters who have completely stumped me. They're prominently featured in Firewalk with me and mentioned in the return, but I can't really figure out how they fit into the Black Lodge stuff. Maybe I missed some important detail, but yeah, not really sure what their deal is. This scene with Cooper and Albert catching up is peak as always. Albert's just on fire with his dialogue, truly a gem of a character. I uh, performed the autopsy on Jacques Renault. Stomach contents revealed, let's see, beer cans, a Maryland license plate, half a bicycle tire, a goat, and a small wooden puppet. Goes by the name of Pinocchio. Also, something I didn't remember was that Wyndham Earl is first mentioned all the way back in this episode, way earlier than I originally thought. It's cool that they're sowing the seeds for future plot lines so early. Agent Earl. He's retired. Yeah, to a nice comfy chair, complete with wrist restraints at the local Laughing Academy. Your former partner flew the coop. Coop. One of the most iconic Twin Peaks scenes is in this episode, that being James and his two girlfriends performing the hit song Just You. There's this little plotline running through the early parts of this season where Donna's mad at James for giving Maddie the fuck me eyes a bit too much, and it starts here. I'll take this opportunity to talk about the soap opera parody aspect of Twin Peaks, which is legit one of my favourite parts. All these cheesy ass scenes of James and Donna and Maddie are always so funny, but in a sincere way. Sometimes it's hard to tell whether it's parody or just playing it straight, but my eyes are always glued to the screen regardless. But yeah, most people seem to hate James and Donna specifically, but I've always been a fan of their silly shenanigans and Just You is a banger. When Maddie's left by herself, Bob shows up to do his usual thing, and it's implied that maybe Maddie's story isn't going to end so well. Frank Silver's performance as Bob has become a staple of Twin Peaks, and considering the story of how he got into the show, it's especially impressive how good a job he does. There's some developments related to Cooper's visit from a giant in a previous episode, particularly Major Briggs revealing that the owls are not what they seem, was part of a random crappy decodes from space monitors or something, as well as Cooper's name repeated. 
I don't really know why he got these messages, but clearly the giant has something to do with it. Maybe he sent them from his abode that we see in the return. Pretty good stuff all around. We're at the point now where every episode going for is just damn good. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... I find myself thinking not of clues or of evidence, but of the content of her smile. Number 31. Case Files. The return is steadily chugging along at this point, with new developments continuing to pop up. The most memorable stuff here is, as usual, the Dougie Jones antics, particularly now that we get to meet all the characters working at the insurance firm. As you would expect, every minute of this stuff is hilarious. Special shoutouts to when Dougie wants the coffee that camera guy from Better Call Saul has, and when this chick has to sneak him into the women's bathroom so he can piss. She continues the trend of everyone in the show wanting to bang Kyle McLaughlin, but he needs to pay too bad. We're also introduced to Shelley's daughter Becky, played by Amanda Seyfried. We see that Norma and Shelley are still doing their usual thing of a double R. And we meet Becky's husband Stephen, played by this guy who has the most evil looking face I've ever seen. Next to the other evil guy in this episode who I'll get to in a minute. This whole dynamic of Shelley's daughter pretty much making the exact same mistake that she did when she was her age, i.e. marrying a dickhead and all that, while Shelley's also continuing to make those same mistakes with this guy that we see later on, is some classic Twin Peaks soap opera stuff with a dash of darkness. And it's one of those plot lines I wish we got to see a bit more of, because Amanda Seyfried kills it in her role. Imagine a meek not only aged gracefully over the 25 years, but is also a damn good actress in her own right. The other evil guy introduced is Richard Horn, and while there are a lot of evil motherfuckers in the return, this guy definitely takes the cake as the biggest dickhead ever put on screen. He definitely makes a bold first impression, not only being in cahoots with the second biggest dickhead, Chad, but grabbing this chick and saying some rather unpleasant things to her, plus the fact that he's basically the spawn of Satan. Constance Talbot continues to be a comedic genius while discussing the Major Briggs body. Here's the headline. Actually, I just gave you the headline. Yeah. I'm still doing stand-up on the weekends. And it turns out there was a ring inside him that came from Dougie and Janie E. I have no idea why Briggs swallowed a ring from Dougie, and the best I can figure is since the Major seemed to be so good at seeing the future and whatnot, he swallowed it so that it could be found and help the FBI guys move the plot forward. The Mitchum brothers are also introduced here, who may end up having the best character progression throughout the series. They're honestly kind of intimidating at first, when they tell Brett Gilman to get fucked for the Mr. Jackpot debacle. Obviously by the end of the show they're completely different, but we'll get to that later. We also get a proper look at what Dr. Jacoby's been up to, which is hosting a conspiracy theorist type video thing for enlightened viewers like Jerry Horn and Nadine. The shovel thing is one of the funniest things in return honestly, and the fact that it sets off Nadine to finally save Ed from a life of being cucked is particularly amusing. There's this part with Tammy doing some research on Cooper that always took me out, because she's got this photo of him that's just blatantly ripped from the original series, specifically the scene of him in the sheriff's station. I don't know if the production team just didn't give a fuck or what, but it's really distracting. Anyway, speaking of Cooper, Mr. C is in prison and there's this really unnerving part where he looks in the mirror and it reminds us of Bob, and his face does this really subtle contortion thing that just gives me the chills. It's clear that Bob is inside Mr. C, but it's obviously not just Bob's personality that he has, otherwise he'd be laughing maniacally and all that jazz. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... The cow jumped over the moon. Number 30. The man behind the glass. There's some real interesting shit in this episode, starting with Leland coming into the station to reveal that he knows Bob from back when he was younger, and if I'm not mistaken I'm pretty sure this is referring to when Leland first got possessed by Bob, which means he's been running around with an evil fucker inside him for decades. An aspect of Leland's character that I'm always thinking about is how aware he was of Bob and his actions, and I'll talk about it more when we get to Fire Walk With Me, but in the original series at least it seems like he doesn't know it all. Cooper and Ben talk about the phone call he got from Audrey, where she mentioned that she saw him wearing a tuxedo, and somehow Cooper doesn't put two and two together that he was wearing that tuxedo at One-Eyed Jack's. Always found that a bit weird. It's not like he wore it anywhere else other than the sheriff's station in the hotel. The Nadine is a high schooler thing officially starts here when she wakes up from her coma, which like with a Windermill shout out from episode 2, I was surprised that it started this early in the season. The Donna James Maddie love triangle continues to be a comedy of errors when James and Maddie get a smooch in right when Donna enters the room, and James's reaction is so funny. Donna! <laughs> so Donna runs to her new boyfriend Harold Smith, who's basically that side guy who says, he did it again, huh? I do love Harold's house with all the flowers, and while I do find his character horribly uncomfortable to watch, I think he's played really well by Lenny Van Dolan. The way he talks is just mesmerizing. This is our introduction to the man, the myth, the legend, Richard Tremaine, who I think I've expressed my love for enough at this point, so I'll just say he's a cool dude and move on. We also meet Jean Renault, who has a French accent for some reason, and yeah, he's pretty intimidating, but I always just forget that he's in this show. 
Considering how many villainous dudes are in Twin Peaks, he doesn't really stand out in any meaningful way. In fact, the whole One-Eyed Jack's plot never really grabbed me beyond that awesome episode where Cooper and Ed went undercover there. Anytime it was on screen after that, I just wanted to get a move on. Alright, the best scene in this episode though is maybe the best in the entire show. I know I said that before, but this time I mean it. It's when Albert delivers his speech to Truman about love. It's one of those Twin Peaks moments, if you know what I mean. A character will seemingly just be this one kind of guy, and then out of nowhere the writer's throne the scene that just completely shifts how you perceive them. I reject absolutely revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such a method is love. I love you, Sheriff Truman. I already loved Albert before this scene because he really is the funniest fucker in the show. Handiwork of Leo Johnson, currently appearing at Calhoun Memorial Hospital as Mr. Potato Head. Anything we should be working on? Yeah. You might practice walking without dragging your knuckles on the floor. But after this, I knew he was goat material. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... Albert's path is a strange and difficult one. Number 29. We are like the dreamer. Alright, get ready for a whole bunch of return episodes. Part 14 is heavily focused on the Twin Peaks side of the story, with the sheriff's crew led by Bobby going to investigate the coordinates that his dad left for them. This whole sequence of them discovering this place and finding this chick who may or may not be Diane is the return at its best. There's a lot of imagery that carries over from part 8, which makes that episode feel less like a one-off random thing. I found it pretty cool that Andy's the one who gets to visit the giant's house. Out of the guys who were there, I would have definitely thought it would be Hawk, what with his spirituality and the fact that he kind of got this whole plotline rolling in the first place. But Andy makes sense too because he's probably the most pure or innocent guy out there. So Andy has not Diane with him and says they need to keep her somewhere safe. And I guess the best place for that is in a cell next to this drunken guy who loves to yap and Chad the evil guy. We finally get to catch up with James after he first showed up back in part 2 and we properly meet his new friend Freddy who may be the single most polarizing character in The Return, mainly because he shows up a couple episodes before the end, and then is instrumental in taking down Bob, who's been basically the main villain of the show since the start. If this were any other show, then I'd completely agree with a sentiment that having a guy come out of nowhere to save a day instead of a character we actually know is pretty lame, but when it comes to Twin Peaks, I'm kinda just along for the ride, and if some British bloke with a glove is gonna be the guy to destroy Bob, then so be it. The story that Freddy tells us of how he got the glove is definitely interesting, and it seems that this is the first time the fireman's been straight up with someone instead of using cryptic nonsense. But yeah, for what little we do get of Freddy, I think he's chill. So Sarah Palmer's been having a fun time this season drinking and watching animals fight, and this episode gives us a new insight into her character. That being, she has some sort of entity inside her that everyone seems to agree is Judy. Now when Judy gets inside, Sarah is up for debate, with most people guessing that it's this creature she eats up in part 8, assuming that girl is Sarah in the first place. I have a different interpretation that I'll talk about when we get to that episode, so for now I'll just say that this scene is both hilarious and freaky as hell. The other stuff of note in this episode is the FBI investigation making some headway. There's a great scene with Gordon and Lucy on the phone, and we find out that Diane is apparently Janie E's half-sister, which I'm not sure if this is true or not, since Diane's a tulpa right now and as such is a bit of an unreliable narrator. If Diane really is related to Janie E, then that's a damn fine coincidence. But if she's just making the shit up, then I'm not really clear on what her motive is, since her telling them that wouldn't really benefit Evil Coop in any way. But also we do see that Tulpa Diane isn't that hot in Evil Coop to begin with, so maybe she's trying to undermine him however she can. The more important part of the scene though is Gordon telling us about his Monica Bellucci dream, and as usual anytime Gordon takes center stage for a scene, it's pure gold. Number 28. There's some fear in letting go. This episode starts by wrapping up one of the longest running plot threads of the entire series. That being Ed and Norma finally, finally getting together. I love this scene with Ed and Aideen. Everett McGill still got those Ed line readings down pat. What? Also love this moment when Ed goes to tell Norma the good news, only to get cucked again by Walter. Honestly, Ed's a better man than me because there's no way in hell I could handle pining after one woman for like 50 years. Thankfully, Norma tells his loser to fuck off and finally makes it official with Ed. With how dark so much of a return is, at least these two got a happy ending, even if it is about 25 years too late. Alright, now for the real interesting shit, which is everything involving Evil Coop. There's some really cool stuff with how the convenience store works, and inside is none other than Philip Jeffries himself, now in tea kettle form. So David Bowie couldn't show up for the return since he was on the verge of death, so Lynch turned him into a kettle. Well, it's not actually a kettle, it's just some nondescript machine, but it sure looks like it. Philip Jeffries is one of the most mysterious characters in Twin Peaks, and I honestly have no idea what his deal is at this point. All the stuff around him is incredibly interesting, I just can't really make any sense of it. 
Anyways, after whatever that was, Evil Cooper is held at gunpoint by Richard, and man is it satisfying to see this fucker get beaten up, especially so effortlessly by Mr. C. There's also Steven and this chick who I didn't even realise was Donna's sister until I was reading the wiki page, but yeah, I guess she also likes drugged up bad boys. It seems like Steven ends up capping himself, which is fine by me. Dougie's plot comes to a pretty abrupt end when he hears Gordon Cole's name on the TV, which I guess gives him the motivation to go and shock himself, which will of course lead into Cooper's grand return next episode. The Dougie Jones plot was the most unexpectedly amazing part of a return, and while I of course would have loved to see the real Cooper for more than barely two episodes, I'm honestly glad we got this instead. It gave us so many awesome new characters, it was hilarious, and also pretty damn touching at points, with how Cooper makes everyone's lives better throughout the course of a series. Damn good stuff. And on a more depressing note, Hawk gets his final call from Margaret Lanterman. The whole situation surrounding Catherine Coulson is such a shame, but at the same time it's amazing that she was still able to be involved considering how close this was to her death, and the show handles it so well, with the sheriff squad assembling to mourn her, and the light going out in her house. The one thing that kinda kills the mood for me is Frank just having this picture of a fish just sitting there on his laptop during this tender moment. The Audrey plot is something I haven't mentioned yet, and I'm gonna put a pin in it for now and get back to it when it's more relevant. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to Number 27 The stars turn and a time presents itself Alright, this is where shit starts getting seriously good. Like I mentioned before, this was aired alongside part 1 as one big premiere, and I guess they wanted to save all the good stuff for this half. There's this great scene with Bill Hastings and Phyllis, who for a character who's only in two episodes, she really left an impression on me. I'm very interested in how she connects to Evil Coop, since she recognised him and seems pretty chill about it before she gets murked. Obviously they were fucking, but why is something I don't have an answer for. We're introduced to Duncan Todd, played by everyone's favourite character actor, Patrick Fischler. And man, he is so good in this show despite doing nothing except sit in this room and then get murdered. You can always count on this guy to be awesome in whatever he shows up in. I love this scene of Evil Coop having a meal with Daria and Ray. Along with that first scene of him in part 1, it really gives you an idea of what this dude's personality is like. Also, I don't know how I didn't notice until now that he's been eating cream corn in this scene. Continuing the trend of showing us how intimidating Evil Coop is, is this scene with him and Daria, which gives us a lot of info about what's going on with Evil Coop and people trying to kill him. Apparently including Philip Jeffries, but it turns out it's actually an imposter. At first I had no idea who this guy impersonating Jeffries is, but listening to his dialogue, specifically this line, you are going back in tomorrow, and I will be with Bob again. I'm thinking that this might be Mike, since he's always been the one most closely associated with Bob, and we know that he wants him to return to the Black Lodge. As for why his voice is different, I have no idea other than obscuring the truth to the audience. I'm probably completely off base with this, but that's just what I got. We also get a lot of great Black Lodge stuff this episode. This scene with Laura calls back to the original series, including her whispering some shit in his ear, and then she screams and flies off for some reason that I can't think of. The arms also undergone a transformation into this tree, and Leland also shows up to tell Cooper to find Laura. I'm assuming this is at least part of what gives Cooper the motivation to go save Laura in part 17, but we'll get to that later. So after all that wacky stuff, we end the episode on the first of what'll become a staple throughout the return, which is the Roadhouse performances. These usually cap off each episode and give us the chance to wind down, listen to some good ass music, and see how the town of Twin Peaks has descended into hell over the years. This first performance of Shadow by Chromatics is easily my favourite across all of them. It introduced me to this band that I now love. We get to see some familiar faces like Shelly and James hanging out. The song is amazing, and the vibes overall are just impeccable. Also, this is the best line in all of Twin Peaks. James is still cool. He's always been cool. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... Hopefully get the information you need. Want. Not need. I don't need anything, Ray. If there's one thing you should know about me, Ray, it's that I don't need anything. I want. And I want that information. Number 26. Don't die. The Dougie plot this episode is straight fire. Janie E finds out about Dougie and Jade, which is a hilarious scene. I've already touched on how good Naomi Watts is as Janie E, and her absolute best scene is when she goes to give the money to these two guys. This is when I knew she was the best character in the return. What kind of 
kind of world are we living in where people can behave like this, treat other people this way without any compassion or feeling for their suffering? The scene of Dougie drawing on the case files is really good for some reason. The song playing over it, Windswept by Johnny Jewell, is just exquisite. It also plays at the end of a previous episode, and as such I'm going to call it the Dougie Jones theme. There's a good scene with Frank and his wife Doris, and man it really is impressive how every single character, even those who only show up for a few episodes, are so memorable. Lynch and Frost can even make the annoying wife character entertaining. And we get to see how much of a cunt Chad is when it's revealed that their son committed suicide. But in terms of characters being cunts, it doesn't get much worse than what Richard gets up to this episode. After this weird ass scene with that guy Shelly scene which makes Richie mad, he goes for a little drive to clear his head. <laughs> this scene is obviously devastating, but I also can't help but laugh at how brutally that kid gets demolished. And then when we see his body it somehow isn't a mangled mess. And Harry Dean Stanton from Firewalk with Me is there too, who's always great to see. This is also actually that same intersection that Laura and Leland got stuck at as well. We also finally get to meet Diane played by Laura Dern, or to be more specific, Tulpa Diane. But nevertheless, it puts to rest that theory that some people had that Diane wasn't real and Cooper was just talking to himself in the original series. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... Jade. So that's her name, is it? Jade give two rides. I'll bet she did. Number 25. What story is that, Charlie? I reckon this is the best episode for the Mr. C plot by far. There's this ridiculously cool segment where he goes to this place to find Ray and ends up having to do an arm wrestling match with this guy Renzo. This scene solidifies Mr. C as a legit badass, and it's not even some epic fight, it's just an arm wrestle. Easily one of my favourite scenes in the return. And this chat with Ray afterwards is also really good, where he finally gets those coordinates that he wanted, not needed from him. I kinda wish we got to learn a bit more about Ray because he's a pretty intriguing character, and he's even got that ring that sends you to the Black Lodge, which apparently some prison guard gave to him. I also love when Richard shows up and it's like love at first sight when he sees how evil Mr. C is. The saga of Dougie Jones making everyone's lives better continues when Janie E gets a new car and gym set courtesy of the Mitchum brothers, and seeing Naomi Watts happy makes me happy as well. There's also this guy who has to poison Dougie, but can't bring himself to, and I love this scene where he confesses everything to Bushnell. We finally get to see Big Ed again, wish he showed up a bit earlier just so we could have a bit more of him, but alas. I love seeing Bobby hanging out with him and Norma, until that bitch Walter shows up to ruin it. There's also this really depressing scene of Ed just sitting at a gas farm by himself. If he and Nadine don't even live together anymore, then surely he could have gotten with Norma without having to wait for her to set him free. They even put the Roadhouse performance before it so we can just have the credits roll over Ed sitting there. Speaking of the Roadhouse performance, it's none other than James goddamn Hurley singing Just You. I swear the return was like vindication for the James fans. Really glad he wasn't just left out like Donna was. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... What is this? Kindergarten? Number 24. Demons. Alright, back to the original series. This is the episode before the big reveal, and as such, most of it is dedicated to wrapping up the side plots that were going on and setting the stage for the heavy hitter of next episode. Maddie's officially leaving Twin Peaks, and man, this scene with her and James is so good. They've got the main theme playing in the background which instantly makes any scene a winner, and their dialogue about how Maddie got to be Laura and all that is all really cute. I said it before, but the soap opera stuff really is one of my favourite aspects of the show, and Maddie is a character who I was genuinely sad to see go even before I knew exactly how she would be going. I think it's never been more obvious in this episode that the writers were really pushing for Cooper and Audrey to be the endgame couple of the show. What with him saving her from One-Eyed Jack's last episode, and then pretty much every second of screen time they share this episode. I've made it clear before that I'm totally pro-Cooper and Annie, but if they weren't going to commit to the Cooper-Audrey ship, then maybe they should have toned down the tension between them instead of just writing it out for as long as they did. So Truman's questioning Donna about Harold Smith and all that, but we don't care about it because motherfucking David Lynch's Gordon Cole just showed up. Perhaps the single most hilarious performance across the whole series is Lynch himself playing this guy. The fact that he's in so few episodes of the original series is something I would cry about, but the fact that he's a mainstay throughout the return is enough for me to overlook it. But yeah, every line of dialogue he has is pure gold. Coat was by Cuna. Sounds real good, Sheriff, but I already ate. You remind me today of a small Mexican chihuahua. And even the more mundane ones are made funny by the fact that he's always on 200% volume. Also love that they never explain what causes hearing to go kaput. And I love how they just forget about Donna and just leave her sitting in that room. 
The Leo vegetable arc gets a head start, which always leads to some good antics, but it's also the start of Bobby's being a dick to Shelly thing, which I'm less of a fan of. I kinda wish Shelly had some more to do in the show beyond just always being stuck in shitty relationships. There's more terrible scenes of Tojimura and Josie and all that, but I'll ignore them because the last scene of the episode more than makes up for it. The squad's got Philip Gerard in for questioning, and he transforms into Mike to deliver a badass monologue about Bob, and at the end drops the bombshell that he's at the Great Northern. Al Strobel's performance is incredible here, and he plays that switch up from Gerard to Mike perfectly. Brilliant setup for next episode. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... Now, Gordon, what the hell is this about a Mexican chihuahua? Number 23. Laura is the one. This episode is both incredibly light-hearted and comical, and extremely dark and shocking. On the fun side of things, Janie E takes Dougie to the doctor and is very impressed when she finds out that Kyle McLaughlin has the ideal male body. This leads to a highly amusing scene where Dougie's just munching on cake while Janie E's giving him the fuck me eyes. It's canonical that Cooper's dick game is so good that he doesn't even need to do anything. The Mitchum brothers get a lot of screen time this episode, which is always a good thing. Patrick Fischler tells the guy working at the insurance firm that he's got to convince the brothers that Dougie's their biggest hater, which seems to work pretty well. Also got to mention Candy, Manny, and Sandy, who are the Mitchum's assistants, secretaries, sex slaves, I have no idea, but I do love them regardless. Candy's going through a bit of a crisis though because she whacks Rod while trying to get a fly like in Breaking Bad. The real miserable stuff in this episode is everything Richard-centric, who's really trying to prove himself as the biggest cockhead on the planet. First the scene where he beats up Miriam because she saw him run that kid over, and for some reason she tells him that she sent the letter to the cops about it. This scene is legitimately scary, with how Richard just runs at her and breaks through the door. Then he goes to his grandma's house to steal her money and shit while Johnny is sitting there with his teddy bear. I have no idea what's up with that thing, but I do not like it. This whole scene is just really uncomfortable to watch, and that bear's just constantly yapping throughout all of it. I'm surprised Richard didn't swipe it off the table. On a more positive note, we get to see Albert on a date while Gordon and Tammy watch. Don't have much to say on this episode, honestly. It's just really good. Number 22. The One-Armed Man. It's finally time to talk about Season 1. The fact that we're over halfway through and we're just now getting to it should indicate how fond I am of this first season. Even the weakest episode is still jam-packed with great moments. Most of Cooper and Truman's time this episode is spent investigating birds, specifically the one that bit Laura, which he finds out about from Gordon on the phone, the first time we are graced with David Lynch's beautiful voice on the show. They've also got to interrogate the titular one-armed man, and check out this moment when Andy drops his gun like an idiot. Also this iconic moment of a veterinarian that wasn't scripted. Yes, but only one has a best friend with one arm. Harry? <coughs> In the heat of the I swear you can see Michael on Kane holding in his laugh. After Andy's little misfire, the boys go to the shooting range for some practice, and this scene is a great example of the chemistry all these guys have together. Cooper makes some hints at his tragic backstory, and Hawk flexes his poetry skills. Audrey's decided to take part in solving the Laura Palmer mystery so that she can impress Cooper with her detective skills or something, and we get one of the somewhat rare scenes between her and Donna. I really dig the dynamic they have going on since they aren't really friends, but they barely interact throughout the rest of the show. Maybe Lara Flynn Boyle and Cheryl and Fenn didn't get along or something. We're also introduced to the bad boy of town, Hank, who's about to get out of prison so he can start his redemption with Norma slash immediately start being a criminal again. Hank isn't the most exciting character in the show or anything, but I think his actor does a great job at sprucing up the material he's given. He plays both the chill guy trying to improve himself and the scumbag criminal sides of his character really well. There's some more cheesy stuff between James and Donna, which I of course love, Whenever they start rolling the Laura Palmer theme, you know it's going to be a good scene. Just a really solid episode. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... He wants it filed with the U.S. Attorney. Sign it under F or forget it. And you tell Albert that if he wants to pursue this, nope. I'll fight him all the way up the nope. chain to Washington. Don't get excited. And I'll talk to you later, Gordon. Number 21. Let's rock. I'm going to say this is the most underrated episode of a return, because it's the lowest rated one on IMDb by a pretty sizable amount. It's probably because of a certain character who I'll get to in a sec. It's a bit of a low-key episode, focusing more on some cute character moments, and it's high-key one of the funniest return episodes. For example, the scene with Gordon and Albert, who comes in to update Gordon and what Diane's up to. This scene is so dragged out that it loops around from being annoying to being hilarious. First when Gordon's fine Bordeaux is leaving, and then when Gordon tells Albert a hilarious joke. She's here visiting a friend of her mother, whose daughter has gone missing. The mother owns a turnip farm. 
I told her to tell the mother that her daughter will turn up eventually. She didn't get it either. Being French, it doesn't translate. I'd really like to get back to this fine Bordeaux. What kind is it? 11.05. There's this great scene with Frank and Benjamin where they discuss how much of a cunt Richard is. The return is so good at these conversation scenes, both in the way they're written and also how good the actors are in their roles. I just wish we got to see Ben interact with some other characters. Alright, it's time to talk about Audrey Horn, who finally shows up this episode. This is probably the most controversial plotline in The Return, and I have some thoughts. First off, it's completely divorced from the rest of what's going on. Audrey doesn't interact with anyone other than this guy Charlie, and for the majority of their scenes you have no idea what they're babbling about. She's mad at Charlie because she wants to go to the roadhouse to find Billy, who she's apparently been fucking, and there's another chick Tina they talk about who she doesn't seem keen on. I'm just going to say that even though I have no idea what's going on, I love all of Audrey's scenes. Mainly because all the dialogue from both her and Charlie is so funny. She just keeps hating on this guy for the entire runtime, and he just wants to go to bed. It's already late and I'm getting sleepy. Cheryl and Fenn and Clark Middleton are both excellent, especially Cheryl who puts so much venom into every swear word. Oh, you know for certain. What fucking crystal ball are you looking into? Why don't you ask your crystal ball where the fuck Billy is who's been missing for two days? Huh? Ask your ball. Come on, Audrey. You know I don't have a crystal ball. Also, she's still a total smoke show 25 years later. I'll get more into this later, but it's highly questionable whether all this shit is actually happening or if it's just in Audrey's mind or something. Billy's definitely a real guy, specifically the one who owns the truck that Richard used to mow down that kid, but the rest, I got no damn clue. Maybe Charlie's supposed to be a therapist or something, maybe she's just having an existential crisis, and to be blunt, the resolution of her story doesn't really clear anything up. Some people think she's still in a coma from a bank explosion, but I find that a bit of a stretch. So while I definitely get why people don't like Audrey's plot this season, I think it's really entertaining. The lack of any Dougie plot this episode is probably another reason why people don't seem too hot on it, but the stuff we do get instead is all really good, so it gets a thumbs up from me. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... Number 20. Realization time. Whole lot of exciting stuff going on in this episode, when the Bookhouse squad gets dressed up to go undercover at One-Eyed Jacks. This is easily Cooper's coolest look, especially those glasses. I'm not gay or anything, but damn. Ed also looks pretty dapper with his moustache, and I wish we got to see more of him involved with the guys like in this episode. We get to see the boys gambling, being suave, all that good stuff. It's like if you dropped a random Bond movie into the show, and it's pretty awesome. This plotline continues into the next episode, so I'll discuss it more then. The other main thing going on is James, Donna, and Maddie are doing a bit of trolling with Dr. Jacoby, because they think he has some evidence related to Laura. This is in my opinion one of the most underrated groups of characters in the show. I've already talked about how much I like the soap opera stuff, but even removed from that, I just think they've got a pretty unique dynamic going on. Donna pretty much only seems interested in using Maddie for her own gain, whether it be this or stealing from Harold Smith's. Meanwhile, James is kind of caught in the middle. And while they're doing all this tomfoolery, Bobby's also around trying to frame James, because he's just a hater. Audrey's detective work at the perfume counter leads her to One-Eyed Jacks, which she's going to be at for the foreseeable future. If you ask me, the best Audrey stuff is when she's interacting with other fun characters, and there aren't really any fun characters at One Eye Jacks, so this stuff isn't anything to write home about beyond turning her into a damsel in distress. This initial scene of her and Blackie is really good though. The Mill subplot is actually pretty entertaining this episode. I know I've ragged on Josie a lot, but in season 1 I think she serves her purpose just fine, since she's mainly connected to the Mill conspiracy with Ben and Catherine, which is easily the best stuff a three of them have to do in the show. Once the mill burns down though, they start to focus more on stuff like Josie's past, and that's when I stop caring. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. Every day, once a day, give yourself a present. Don't plan it, don't wait for it, just let it happen. Could be a new shirt at the men's store, a cat nap in your office chair, or two cups of good hot black coffee. Number 19. This is the chair. This episode is damn good, mainly the FBI plot. 
So the Blue Rose squad joins up with the Buckhorn guys to find out about Major Briggs' body, and the best part of this is Albert and Talbot meeting for the first time. I just realized while saying this that their names rhyme. More proof that they were meant to be together. Another great scene is when Tammy questions Bill Hastings about what went on with Roof. This is definitely Matthew Lillard's standout scene, and he's crying and blubbering so much that his performance is bordering on annoying, but honestly, if you'd seen the shit that his character has, then that's probably how most of us would be acting. Also, just want to mention how cool it is that Major Briggs is a core part of a return, even though his actor had been long dead by the time I started writing it. So that stuff's all peak, but there's an even better plot going on this episode, which is everything to do with Bobby. Him and the boys go to his mum's house to get info on his dad and Cooper, and it turns out that Garland has foreseen all of this and told her to give him the info. This scene is masterfully acted by both Charlotte Stewart and Dana Ashbrook, and it calls back to that amazing scene with Bobby and his dad back in season 2. And then Bobby gets to be the man of the hour again, because it turns out he's the only one who can open this thing and leave the fellas to where they're supposed to go. Bobby's character is so good in the return, and it all ties back to that vision his dad had of him. Also during the Roadhouse performance, Sky Ferreira shows up playing this chick with a rash. These scenes of the Roadhouse always do a great job at just giving us some slice of life stuff, and showing how the town of Twin Peaks has kind of gone to shit ever since Cooper left. All the other plots just kind of chill out a bit this episode, but that's fine because even when nothing's happening, which is pretty often on this show, the interactions between characters are always a joy to watch regardless. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... Kill that phone and clear out of this place. Number 18. Drive with a dead girl. This is the episode in between the reveal of Leland as Bob and him meeting his demise, and as such it's the only full episode we get to spend with him in his new era. Every scene with him that we do get is supremely entertaining, and Ray Weiss's Bob as Leland is one of the best performances in the show. It's also really cool for us for audience to be a step ahead of the rest of the characters trying to figure out what's going on. I particularly love this scene where he's just driving around like a drunk with Maddie's body in the boot and gets pulled over by Harry and Coop. It's almost like he's trying to get himself caught in this scene, with him bringing Cooper over to take a look at his golf clubs right next to Maddie's body. It even looks like he's about to whack Cooper in broad daylight, but thankfully he's called away for some important stuff. So Ben's currently arrested for the murder of Laura, and we obviously know that he didn't do it, so all these scenes of him getting evidence mounted on him make me feel pretty bad for him, even though it's not like he's some innocent guy. I like seeing Jerry act as his lawyer, but I gotta wonder why Leland wasn't called in since his job is literally Ben's attorney. I guess it's because Leland's guilty of murder himself. The scene of Ben and Jerry reminiscing about their childhoods with the amazing Angelo Badalamenti score is great too. I also really like the scene of Coop and Harry butting heads, because Coop has realized that Ben isn't their guy and wants to release him, but Harry's gotten sick of his silliness and just wants to put someone behind bars. You can see where Harry's coming from, and Cooper's pretty understanding about it, but all that gets thrown out the window at the end when they discover Maddie's body, in a scene that has some extreme parallels to when Laura's discovered, even her theme playing over it. So all that stuff is awesome, but what's less awesome is the usual side plot stuff. Norma's mother Vivian comes to town to be a cow, and the Lucy Andy sperm plot continues to go around in circles. Other than that though, it's a great episode, even if it is doomed to be sandwiched between two of the best of the entire series. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to In another time, another culture, he may have been a seer, a shaman priest. In our world, he's a shoe salesman and lives among the shadows. Number 17. Brings back some memories. The first couple episodes of A Return were already really good, but this is the one that got me locked in. The Dougie plot gets even better with the introduction of Janie E, and this sequence of him getting ready in the morning is all comedy gold, especially when he ignores Mike yapping about stuff to go pee. I should probably mention how no one ever seems that concerned that Dougie is basically a vegetable, when we can see in the last episode that Dougie seemed like a pretty normal guy capable of talking at least. Bushnell mentions that Dougie was in a car accident, and Janie E makes reference to him having one of his episodes, so I guess this car accident fucked him up and sometimes he just can't do anything. It could also be a commentary on people not noticing when there's something obviously wrong with someone, whether it be on purpose or subconsciously. Also I really need this coffee mug. Denise gets to make an appearance this episode to chat with Gordon, and it's great to see her considering she originated from the so-called bad part of season 2, so it's nice that Lynch and Frost didn't just ignore everything from that era. The rest of the FBI stuff this episode is pretty great, with the gang heading to South Dakota to check out Cooper as being held there. The scene with Albert and Gordon in the car is really funny. Agent Preston gets car sick. Albert, we're in South Dakota. Cossacks are in Russia. But the background outside the car looks so supremely fake I can't tell if it's on purpose or if they just didn't care. Kyle McLaughlin's performance in this scene is incredibly creepy. It sounds like they slowed down his voice or something because he sounds really weird. 
I do like that Mr. C has no idea how to act like the real Cooper beyond giving a thumbs up. Albert and Gordon discuss how weird this all is in another great scene, and for some reason there's this blue filter over it. I can't tell if this is supposed to be a really bad day for night, or if it's just blue because they're discussing a blue rose case, but I low-key dig the look. Also, they're not even subtle about why Tammy's there. The Twin Peaks side of the story is also really good, first with the introduction of Frank Truman, Harry's brother. Michael Onkeen didn't return for this season, and I think that's just because he was retired, but if you ask me, it was a blessing in disguise because Robert Forster killed it as his replacement. Most notably, he is pitch perfect in this scene with Michael Sarah as Wally Brando. His facial expressions are on point. Also, yeah, Michael Sarah is in this scene, and man, does he leave an impression. We're also reintroduced to Bobby, who has gone through the biggest makeover out of the entire cast. No longer the bad boy of the town, but now an upstanding citizen. Dana Ashbrook totally sells this new version of Bobby, especially in the scene when he sees Laura's photo and we finally get a hit of a Battle of Menti score from the original series. In most cases, this scene would come across laughable, but Ashbrook pulls it off so well. So yeah, just a whole lot of awesomeness in this episode, I got zero problems with it. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... Hi! Number 16. Rest in Pain. This episode is mostly focused on Laura's funeral and as such is ripe with emotions. First we've got Albert at perhaps his most cunty trying to do work on Laura's body, while Doc Haywood is mad because they're supposed to be burying the body. I love watching Albert being an arsehole, but it is also satisfying to see him get his shit rocked by Harry. Audrey's trying to make a move on Cooper by giving him info about Laura, but it's interrupted by Harry and Lucy. Apparently Cooper knows who killed Laura, but he forgot. How convenient. Maddie comes to town for the funeral, who of course looks exactly like Laura. Apparently this character was made up by Lynch because he knew that Cheryl Lee was something special and couldn't let her go to waste by just playing a corpse. I'm glad he did invent her though because Maddie's really cool. But enough beating around the bush, we're all here for Laura's funeral, and by that I mean this is the only scene in the show where pretty much every character is in the same place together. As such, it's a golden opportunity for drama, which Bobby takes by yelling about how it's everyone's fault that Laura's dead. This rant is great because not only is it true, it shows us that Bobby's the only one there who's willing to say what's what. But I guess it makes James mad, so they fight about it while Leland rides Laura's coffin up and down. Apparently this bit was suggested by Ray Weiss, so shout out to him. After all that, Cooper's introduced to the Bookhouse Boys, which has apparently been a thing in Twin Peaks for generations. I love how this little secret society with their own badges and a secret signal is all played completely straight, and Cooper doesn't question it at all. But why isn't Andy part of it? There's more Josie and Harry scenes which put me to sleep, and then there's this random conversation about the soul with Cooper and Hawk that's just really damn good. I'm sorry if I sound like a broken record at this point, but I don't know how many different ways I can say a scene is good. Also, Leland in this scene is just like me. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... Short stack of griddle cakes, melted butter, maple syrup, lightly heated, slice of ham. Nothing beats the taste sensation when maple syrup collides with ham. Number 15. Cooper's Dreams. An episode like this one is a classic example of one where there isn't exactly one standout scene, but everything just works to create a great episode. The main thrust of the plot is trying to find some more info on Jacques Renault, particularly a cabin of his in the woods. When the squad of Cooper, Truman, Hawk, and Doc Haywood for some reason set out to find it, they instead find Margaret, and we get what is probably her best scene across the show. She's already been expecting them because she just knows shit like that, and even has prepared tea and cookies. No cake. Well, that's very kind of you, ma'am, but I don't believe that... What kind of cookies? Wait for the tea. The fish aren't running. After that, the boys find the cabin they were actually looking for, and we get one of the coolest shots in all of fiction. Although I do wish it was Andy or Big Ed instead of Doc Haywood at the end there. Not that I hate Haywood or anything, I just wouldn't exactly call him one of the boys. There's actually a lot of really good shots in this episode, including a similar one earlier on. Shoutouts to director Leslie Linker Gladder, who's directed the most Twin Peaks episode after David Lynch, of course. During this scene is another amazing Julie Cruz song, Into the Night, which turns out to just be playing of a record player. Jacques Renault has excellent taste in music. The scene of Bobby's family getting therapy with Dr. Jacoby is also really good, since Jacoby manages to get Bobby to break down and confess that Laura was kind of a shitty girlfriend. The scene transitions quite beautifully to a bird flying, and then to the boys in the woods. All the scenes just flow so well together in this episode. Donna and James officially recruit Maddie to their quest to find out the truth about Laura, which is going to end up doing more harm than good. I mean, first they put Jacoby in the hospital, and then Harold Smith necks himself after Donna's chicanery, so yeah. In this same scene, we get to see that Hank's returned to town, and is already acting shifty as hell. In fact, the same episode that he gets out of prison, he immediately goes and beats up Leo. 
Even the Josie plot is good this episode. It turns out she's in the loop with Ben and the plan to burn the mill. Just a really solid episode all around. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... How are you? Well, Audrey, to be perfectly honest, I'm tired and a little on edge. Oh. Number 14. Traces to Nowhere. Alright, every episode from here on out is a 10 out of 10 in my book. Obviously we have the pilot to thank for setting up everything we love about Twin Peaks, but this is the episode that really gets the ball rolling if you ask me. So many iconic scenes to be found here, like the first of many Cooper ordering food scenes, as well as him drinking the Great Northern Coffee for the first time. Cooper meets Audrey here and the sexual tension is already off the charts. Shame it never really came to fruition. Also this reintroduction of Cooper of him hanging upside down talking to Diane is awesome, especially his musings at the end about JFK. Speaking of iconic scenes, the single best line of dialogue in the entire show is in this episode. Fellas, don't drink that coffee. You'd never guess. There was a fish in the percolator. Man, do I love Jack Nance. The scene of James getting interrogated is amazing, and so is the scene of Donna and her mum. I know people rag on James and especially Donna, but I've always loved the humanity they bring to the show. Plus the Angelo Badalamenti score elevates even the most basic of scenes into something special. Also for some reason Donna's got James over at her house for dinner with her parents, even though she's still technically with Mike, and also Laura died not even 48 hours ago, but no one seems to care too much. Bobby and Mike see this, and now their hate bonus for James just reach Uncle Milton proportions. We start learning about the Grand Mill conspiracy, with Catherine and Ben getting it on while discussing their nefarious plans. Catherine isn't exactly one of my favourite characters, but whenever she's on screen with Ben or Pete it's usually pretty entertaining. So while the pilot is still the gold standard for setting up a series, we have this episode to thank for managing to keep the momentum going and piling on so many iconic moments at the same time. Choosing the Cooper quote of the episode was particularly hard this time because there's so many great ones. Mr. Cooper, uh, how do you take it? Black as midnight on a moonless night. Pretty black. Now, I'd like two eggs over hard. I know, don't tell me, it's hard on the arteries. But old habits die hard. Just about as hard as I want those eggs. Let's be back here in three minutes. Harry, I really have to urinate. They got a cherry pie there. That'll kill you. But it really couldn't go to anything other than... You know, this is, excuse me, a damn fine cup of coffee. I've had, I can't tell you how many cups of coffee in my life, and this, this is one of the best. Number 13. The Last Evening This is an absolutely killer season finale, with so many great cliffhangers. All the plot lines across the town reach a climax, but if you came into this episode expecting answers, then you're going to be waiting a while longer. The undercover One-Eyed Jack's operation continues to be cool as hell, with Cooper managing to get a one-on-one -on -one convo with Jacques Renault. The scene is pretty damn tense, and Jacques' actor does a great job selling how disgusting this guy is. Leo is probably at his most intimidating this episode. In fact, he's so evil that it's almost comical. He's taken Shelly to the mill that he's about to burn down, tied her up, and even set an hour-long countdown timer for good measure. Thankfully, Leo quickly gets his comeuppance when he and Bobby get into a tussle, and he's shot by Hank. It seems like Leo can't go more than a few days without getting shot. The rest of the Pack and Martell stuff is also really damn good, with explanations of what Josie and Hank's relationship is, Catherine and Pete having an emotional moment while trying to find the ledger, and Catherine even gets a redemption moment when she saves Shelley from the fire. And continuing the trend of great cliffhangers is Audrey getting a job at One-Eyed Jack's, and then the reveal that her first client is none other than her father. Andy and Lucy's feud reaches some sort of resolution too, with her revealing that she's pregnant in one of their funniest scenes together. So all that's fantastic already, but if you ask me, the real show steal of this episode is Leland. Once he catches wind that the cops have arrested Laura's killer, or at least a suspect, he goes right over there to smother him to death with a pillow. Ray Weiss's performance with his silent screaming is amazing, and this scene leaves me with a lot of questions in regards to was this Bob or was it Leland, or some combination of both. If you ask me, it's definitely Leland, but Fire Walk With Me makes the separation between him and Bob a lot more hazy, so I can't really say for certain. And on top of all of that, you've got Nadine trying to kill herself, Jacoby having a heart attack, and then Agent Cooper getting shot, capping off a truly spectacular episode, and giving us plenty of big questions going into season 2. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... 24 hour room service must be one of the premier achievements of modern civilization. Number 12. It's time for that episode. What can I even say about this one, other than that it's easily the most unique hour of TV that I've ever seen? 
The first time I watched this shit, I was utterly dumbfounded, and honestly at a complete loss as to what any of it means. But with subsequent watches, I've managed to piece together some kind of interpretation of what it all means. Fair warning that everything I'm about to say is most likely completely off base, but it's what I got. So first off, I'm going to say that this place with the fireman's hanging out in is the White Lodge. We see him watching on his TV this entity spinning out a bunch of shit including the Bob Orb, so I'm assuming this is when Bob was created, and I'm sure that this creature is supposed to be Judy, the ultimate evil presence throughout Twin Peaks. The nuke that we saw at the start of the sequence seemingly either created Judy, or enabled Judy to start spewing out evil orbs and whatnot. Makes sense considering the atomic bomb is probably the most evil thing humanity ever created, and as such, we can add creating supernatural demons to the list of things Oppenheimer is guilty of. So the fireman sees this and creates a paragon of goodness to counter Bob, which is this Laura Palmer orb. We then see him send her off to Earth. I think so far this is all pretty well agreed on by the community, but here's where my interpretation starts to differ. So after that, the very next thing we see is this delightful little creature hatching out of an egg on Earth, which eventually ends up crawling in this girl's mouth in one of the yuckiest scenes I've ever seen on TV. Pretty much everyone agrees that this girl is supposed to be Sarah Palmer, but what the creature's supposed to be is a bit more hazy. The most common theory I've seen is that this little guy is supposed to be Judy, who as we learn throughout the return has possessed Sarah Palmer. But what I think is that it's supposed to be that Laura Palmer orb thing we saw the fireman make and send to Earth. Now why the orb decided to turn into a disgusting slug is something I have no answer to, but the fact that we're shown it hatching from the egg immediately after the Laura orb thing leads me to believe that they're one and the same. So this means that essence of Laura, or whatever you want to call it, is living inside Sarah, and when she gets pregnant she'll give birth to Laura Palmer. I don't really buy that as Judy, because while we do see that Sarah isn't exactly normal for the original series, I don't see any reason to think that she's being possessed by some evil spirit. The side effect of this interpretation is that we now have no idea when or how Judy started inhabiting Sarah. So that's the rundown on what I thought the episode was about, so now I can just talk about how incredible the visuals are. I mentioned the return having pretty silly effects, but I'm gonna guess that's because majority of the budget went to this episode, and man was it worth it. The explosion at the start and the rest of that sequence is mesmerizing. These visuals paired with the incredible sound design leaves you with an experience that no other show or movie could even hope to replicate. And before any of that stuff, you already know the episode's going to be different from the rest, because the Roadhouse performance starts only 10 minutes in. This episode may not be my favourite, but I can totally understand why so many of you call it the best of Twin Peaks. For me though, I prefer the more silly stuff, but I cannot deny the power this episode has. Number 11. Beyond Life and Death The finale of Season 2 is certainly not what anyone expected. Before we get to the real good stuff though, let me just touch on the rest of what's going on. The Nadine High School Iraq is abruptly put to an end after she got hit in the head last episode, which means Ed and Norma's plans to get married are also put to an end. The Mystery Box storyline has perhaps my favourite payoff in the entire show. Andrew and Pete show up at the bank with a key from the box, and Audrey's there too protesting the bank financing Ghostwood. I guess she didn't think that far ahead though, because the door to the vault can still open just fine with her chain to it. Anyways, Andrew and Pete find the locker that the key opens and... <laughs> this shit is so funny, but it's a bit of a shame that nice guy Pete gets such a gruesome fate. The Ben Horn as Donna's real father plotline also reaches an explosive end, when Doc Hayward gets mad at him for ruining everything and fucks him up. When I first saw this, I was like, oh shit, Ben's dead. But he seems pretty normal in the return, so I'm going to assume there wasn't any lasting injury from that. Time for the real meat of the episode though, which is Cooper entering the Black Lodge. This runs continuously for the last 20 minutes, and it's all fantastic stuff. There's Laura showing up to promise us she'll be back in 25 years, Wyndham Earl getting annihilated by Bob, Cooper trying to drink coffee, and some of the scariest shit in all of Twin Peaks. Thank god the Red Room aesthetic didn't just stay as a dream Cooper had for one episode, because this episode solidified it as the most iconic aspect of the show. My favourite moment of this whole sequence is when Cooper's being chased by Evil Coop, and how the lights just turn off as soon as Evil Coop catches up to him, and then Bob just laughing at the camera. Also love how Harry refuses to leave until Cooper returns, proving how close he and Coop have gotten throughout the show. And it all leads up to the most painful cliffhanger ever, doubly so considering for the longest time this was where Twin Peaks ended. I'm just glad I watched this show after the return came out, because an ending like that would have driven me crazy. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... How's Andy? How's Andy? How's Andy? Number 10. Zen, or the skill to catch a killer. 
If you ask me, this is the single most memorable episode of the entire show. It's the episode that really made Twin Peaks what it is today. Almost every scene is iconic in its own right, so let's just start from the top. Jerry Horn arrives with brie and butter sandwiches in a scene that never fails to make me hungry. Those baguettes look so damn good, and Ben really sells just how delectable they are. Leo is intimidating as fuck to those goofballs Bobby and Mike, and after watching the whole show, I honestly forgot that Leo was once an actually pretty scary guy before he just became a laughing stock. Audrey and Donna chat about coffee and how dreamy Kyle McLaughlin is. Leland cries while dancing with Laura's picture, that's all fine and dandy, but now for the real good shit. Albert motherfucking Rosenfield shows up in this episode, and I think I've run out of ways to say how much I love this character. But I don't need to because let's be honest, he's probably your favourite character too. The Tibetan Method scene is one of my favourites across all of Twin Peaks. It's Cooper at his most Cooperish, and the reactions from the rest of the Sheriff's Squad are just golden. I am first going to tell you a little bit about the country called Tibet. But the real highlight is of course at the end of the episode, when Cooper has a dream. I can't even imagine what it would have been like as an audience member watching the shit when it came out. Kyle's old age makeup is definitely questionable, to the point where it's hard to tell if that's what they were even going for. When people think Twin Peaks, they think weird, and while there was certainly plenty of that in the first two episodes, this was the one that solidified what Twin Peaks really is, both in the tone and the visual presentation, and it caps off what I would call a perfect first three episodes. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... Number 9. The past dictates the future. Oh boy. The last two parts of a return are without a doubt the most interesting episodes of TV I've ever watched. Part 8 set the stage for the truly abstract shit in this season, and these last two episodes roll full steam ahead on that train of thought. Part 17 is like the ultimate rug pull. Throughout the episode we get to see all these plot lines that were slowly being built throughout the season finally converge on one point, and we get to see the villain get defeated in an epic showdown, and Cooper gets to make a grand speech about how cool everyone is. But just when you think Lynch is finally going to give us that closure we were all hoping for, the episode shifts in a whole new direction. But let's reel it back a bit. Evil Coop meeting up with Andy and Lucy and Frank is all great, and Evil Coop continues to be terrible at impersonating the real Cooper. Speaking of which, this is one of like two episodes that we get to spend with a real Dale Cooper not in vegetable mode, and it's so glorious that it makes me livid we got so little time with him. I love him reuniting with Gordon, but I'm pretty mad that he ignores Albert who's standing right there. Also it turns out that eyeless chick was Diane all along, uh, I think. I got some issues with this scene, mainly that it acts like Diane was the love of Cooper's life or something, and hey, maybe she was, but we sure as hell didn't get to see that. Didn't we spend several episodes of season 2 building up Annie as Cooper's love? Also, where the hell is Annie? She's barely mentioned at all throughout this entire season, and it's not like she died in a black lodge because Doc Hayward said she was going to be fine. Most of this is coming from me being an Annie fan and wanting to see more of her, but it's something that's always bugged me regardless. Should probably also mention Bob being destroyed by Freddy, which I'm pretty chill with honestly. It's not like we were going to get some kind of fight scene between Good Coop and Evil Coop. Cooper does seem to already know Freddy's destiny, which I'm just going to assume that the fireman told him about while they were hanging out in his room. Alright, now for the coolest, strangest, most amazing thing I've ever witnessed. Cooper decides he isn't done yet and time travels back to the night Laura was murdered. Why the hell he thinks this is a good idea is something I cannot wrap my head around, but I'm pretty sure it just comes down to him being unable to stop that urge he has to help people. But man, this entire sequence where we get to revisit Firewalk with me from a different perspective is just incredible. They even explained why Laura screamed at some unseen thing in the woods, even though I highly doubt that was what Lynch originally intended it to be, if it was even anything at all. The new footage fits seamlessly with the original, and it might just be the most impressive filmmaking in the show. There's some nostalgic footage from the pilot, except now Laura's body has vanished. Pete even gets to go fishing. And then the rug gets pulled again, when Laura suddenly disappears while Cooper's leading her away. I'll get to that in just a sec, but for now, I'll just say that this is an amazing episode that had me on the edge of my seat all the way through. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... The past dictates the future. Number 8. What is your name? The final episode of Twin Peaks is... Uh, it's something alright. So this episode is basically Cooper and Diane driving into a different reality, and then Cooper trying to find Laura. First off, let's touch on why Laura disappeared at the end of part 17. I'm pretty sure what's going on is Judy caught wind of Cooper's plan to save Laura, so she took her and sent her to this alternate dimension. The discussion on what this reality is can get pretty meta, 
with some people thinking that it's meant to be the real world, since the lady who answers the door at Laura's house at the end is actually the real life homeowner. I don't personally think this though, I believe it's just a reality created by Judy to troll Cooper in, mainly thanks to this diner that he goes to being called Eat at Judy's. So when Cooper and Diane cross over to this new dimension, it seems they also lose their identity to some degree. Cooper is acting weird as hell in this episode, almost like a cross between his usual self and Mr. C. After this incredibly uncomfortable sex scene with him and Diane, she takes off and leaves him a note which addresses him as Richard and herself as Linda. So maybe Richard and Linda are what their identities are in this reality, and overnight they became those different versions of themselves, like how in this reality Laura is Carrie Page. Also, when Cooper wakes up the next morning, the hotel room looks the same, but when he goes outside, it's clearly a different place, and he definitely wasn't driving that car before. Also, Diane sees herself when she's in the car, no idea what's up with that, and honestly, I have no idea why Diane is even here. Maybe Cooper brought her with him because the fireman told him about Richard and Linda, and she needs to be with him to make the jump. This TikTok scene with Cooper beating up these guys is pretty cool, and it really does reek of Mr. C behavior. Laura aka Carrie Page seems pretty eager to leave this place, and there's a dead body there, but we don't care about that. They drive a whole bunch, and then we get to the final scene. The atmosphere during this entire sequence is spectacular, and Cheryl Lee gets to deliver one more scream for the ages to end the series on. The chick living at Laura's house identifies herself as Tremond, which calls back to that character from season 2 in Fire Walk With Me, and I got no idea what all that's about. Maybe Tremond is meant to be Judy? As for why Carrie screams at the end, my best guess is the trauma of the original Laura's timeline is so strong that it transcends realities and all comes flooding into her memories at once, hence the scream of terror. The ending is genius because there's so many aspects of it to think about, and I'll probably be thinking about it for the rest of my life. At least Dougie and Janie got a happy ending though. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... What year is this? Number 7. Lonely Souls. Before I started watching the show for this video, I was certain this was going to be the number one. I'm just going to jump right into it. The reveal in this episode is the best scene of the entire show. Everything about it is so masterful. The constant record scratching sound of a background, Ray Weiss's incredible performance, the way the murderer and Maddie is shot with it constantly switching between Leland and Bob, Cheryl Lee's devastating acting, it's all just perfect. Not just the scene itself, but the way the episode bait and switches you at the last moment. Throughout the episode, everything seemingly pointing to Ben Horn as our final suspect. Mike goes crazy when he sees him, he confesses to Audrey that he loved Laura but didn't say anything when asked if he killed her, the secret Laura diary mentions him by name, and with all that Ben is finally arrested. So yeah, mystery solved. Ben Horn killed Laura Palmer. And then Leland looks in the mirror and everything changes. I love the build up to this moment with all the characters heading to the roadhouse for a couple bevs, and then the giant showing up to let us know that shit is about to go down. The aftermath of the murder is also amazing, with everyone sensing that something's happened while Julie Cruz's beautiful voice serenades us with the world spins. Perhaps the best ending to any episode. So it sounds like this is the best episode ever, why isn't it a number one? Well, everything else going on that isn't Laura murder centric is kinda whatever. The aftermath of the Harold Smith incident is really good, with his haunting shot of his body hanging with his head out of sight. The Shelly Bobby Leo plot is pretty lame, I'm not that big on this whole arc of them just trying to make insurance money off Leo, even if it does have some pretty funny moments. The Tojimura plot continues to be terrible, but at least this episode is basically the end of it. The scene with Audrey and Ben is really good though, Richard Beamer is so good in this role. He probably could have done a better job at not making himself look guilty as sin though. Get out of here, go on, go on. I'm gonna go out for a sandwich. Oh, no, no! No! So yeah, this episode is amazing, but there's a couple more I think are just a bit better. Number 6. No Knock, No Doorbell This is the highest rated episode of the entire series on IMDb, and it's easy to see why. Several plot lines reach major turning points, including one of the most satisfying scenes in the show. Starting off on a good foot, we've got Evil Coop and Richard Horn arriving at one of the sets of coordinates he was given, and Richard being sent to test them out resulting in him exploding. Turns out that this set of coordinates was intended to bait Evil Coop in to kill him and send him back to the Black Lodge, but he was smart enough to send out a test subject first. There's also the big reveal that Richard is his son, who he conceived with Audrey while she was in a coma. Yeah. Hutch and Chantel's storylines come to a pretty amusing end when this guy gets mad at them for parking slightly in front of his driveway. The Mitchum brothers' reactions are the icing on the cake. What the fuck kind of neighborhood is this? People are under a lot of stress, Bradley. 
Now for the scene to end all scenes, the reason everyone loves this episode, Dale fucking Cooper is back for real, finally. I love the Dougie Jones saga as much as everyone, but seeing Cooper back to his old self after such a long wait really hit me in the feels. And Lynch and Frost knew that because they've got the Twin Peaks theme playing and Cooper delivering the greatest one-liner in history. What about the FBI? I am the FBI. Cooper's farewell to Janie E and Sunny Jim is similarly emotional. Naomi Watts continues to be amazing in every scene she's given, and her chemistry of Kyle McLaughlin throughout the show was truly something special. The scene of Diane revealing what happened that night with her and Cooper is amazing as well. Laura Dern's performance is unreal. Albert and Tammy are quick to pull the trigger on her, but Gordon's gone soft in his old age. Now for the weirdest part, Audrey's final scene. I guess her and Charlie finally stopped arguing because they managed to make it to the roadhouse. Then things get very, very interesting. The guy announces Audrey's dance, which is the title of that track she danced to back in season 1, but it obviously wasn't called that in-universe. This has led some people to believe that Audrey's plot is some sort of meta-commentary, and there's actually more to support this. The Billy Audrey's looking for could actually be referring to Billy Zane, and when we see her in the mirror at the end, it could actually be Cheryl and Fenn herself we're seeing, not Audrey. I'm not really a fan of meta-interpretations like this, and I'm personally on the team of Audrey being in some kind of mental ward, and this last shot is her coming back to reality. Fantastic episode all around, and it proves that Lynch can throw us a bone once in a while. I don't think I even need to say what the best Cooper quote is. Number 5. Arbitrary Law This episode is like the ultimate climax of Twin Peaks. Everything has been building up to this moment. After the death of Maddie, Cooper decides he needs 24 hours to end this misery once and for all, and he's got his squad backing him up, including Albert. Throughout this episode, there's this feeling of everything coming together, and it gives it this constant push of momentum unlike any other episode. People have criticised it for being too fast-paced and the mystery solving itself too easily, and I can 100% see that point of view, but everything's so well put together that it just works for me. After Cooper gets some more info from Donna and Mike, there's this crazy scene where he assembles the Avengers at the Roadhouse to do some magic. This is when everything comes together for Cooper, and with the music and visuals it gives me real chills. It all leads to this great bait and switch on Leland to get him in the cell, and Bob wastes no time making it immediately obvious that he's their man. Ray Wise's performance throughout the sequence is the stuff of legends, both his betrayal of Bob and when Leland realises all the terrible things he's done. I did find it a bit convenient that Leland's just killed off immediately after he's implicated, but the scene is so good that I don't mind. So all that's fantastic, but there's also this great scene of James and Donna after she realises Maddie is dead, this other scene with her and Leland that's incredibly tense, and the final scene of the episode which might just be my favourite. All the boys hang out and muse on what the hell just happened, with Albert having one of my favourite lines in the show. Maybe that's all Bob is. The evil that men do. And Truman ends us on the sinister note of where is Bob now? What an episode. Maybe a bit conventional and quick in how it plays out, and I do have problems with how Bob is portrayed in relation to Leland, something we'll talk about more with Firewalk with me, but this episode gets me excited every time I watch it. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to... God help me, I don't know where to start. Number 4. Northwest Passage. It all starts right here. This has got to be one of the best pilots for any TV show. Over the course of 90 minutes, we experience the full spectrum of emotions as the news of Laura Palmer's death ripples throughout the town. I think my favourite scene is at the school, when the principal announces the news over the intercom. This guy playing the principal is only in this episode, but damn does he make an everlasting impression with his performance. Huge props also to Lara Flynn Boyle who does a great job crying, and I love this moment of James snapping the pencil. Both Ray Weiss and Grace Zabriskie do amazing jobs displaying their character's grief, not just in this episode, but across the whole season. You also can't forget Pete More breaking the news over heard. the phone to Truman. She's dead. Wrapped in plastic. But while we're on the subject of character introductions, it would be silly not to bring up special agent Dale Cooper, our main character who doesn't show up until 36 minutes in. It was incredibly smart of Lynch and Frost to hold off on throwing Cooper into the mix until after we've met all the other characters, and this first scene tells us all the important stuff. This guy loves to talk, he doesn't let any detail go to waste, and he's got an appreciation for the finer things in life. The other standout scene for Cooper's character is when he and Truman are interrogating Bobby, and his reaction after Bobby gets all mad is just perfect. What difference does it make? I didn't kill her! Bobby, here's how this works. We ask the questions, and you answer the questions that we ask. The most important character we're introduced to, though, is Angelo Badalamenti's score. Where do I even begin with this? 
The Twin Peaks soundtrack is so ingrained in my head that I cannot imagine a show without it. The whole show, and especially this episode, loves to use Laura Palmer's theme any chance it can get, and it never ever gets old. The intro theme has vibes that are indescribable, and while we're on the subject, this is easily my favourite intro to any TV show, right up there with Game of Thrones. You won't catch me skipping that shit ever. Also gotta talk about the visual style of this show, not just the David Lynch weirdness, but the beautiful colour palette. The rich browns and oranges of a great northern hotel, the beautiful pink skies, everyone's drippy 90s outfits, this show has a look unlike any other, and the 4x3 aspect ratio may be a product of its time, but I think it just adds to it. I could keep going, but I really don't want this video to be longer than 2 hours, so I'm just gonna stop there and say that this is a perfect episode. The best Cooper quote of the episode goes to 54 degrees on a slightly overcast day, where the man said rain. You get paid that kind of money for being wrong 60% of the time, and be working. Number 3. Firewalk With Me This movie is one that has grown on me more with each watch. The first time I was kind of thrown off by the bizarre tone shifts from the opening 30 minutes and the rest of it, but with subsequent watches I've now realised that this is some of the best Twin Peaks to ever exist. It's easily the darkest Lynch has ever gone, as we follow Laura Palmer through the last few days of her life and witness all the horrors of Twin Peaks from her point of view. Cheryl Lee's performance is genuinely Oscar-worthy, and she's given so much incredible material to work with, whether it's discovering her father's the one who's been coming in for her window for years, or laughing hysterically at Bobby killing a guy. The sense of inevitability surrounding her incoming doom is constantly building throughout the entire film, and it makes the whole thing so much more depressing. The movie is also a brilliant showcase of Ray Weiss's acting chops, with Leland being portrayed as a lot more sinister than in the show. It really brings up the question of how much of Bob is in Leland and vice versa, and if instead of Bob being a completely separate side of him, he instead feeds off the darkness that's already in Leland. Scenes like this one of him examining Laura's dirty hands and all his scenes after he finds out he's Bob are incredibly unnerving, and when the story finally gets to a murder, it's epic, horrifying, and nightmarish. But there's some light at the end of the tunnel, because the last scene of the movie is Laura in the Black Lodge with Cooper comforting her, and it seems she found some sort of peace. For now, at least. But before all that depressing stuff is the prologue of the film, which is more in line with the original series and focuses on the FBI investigating Teresa Banks' murder. This is where most of the big mysteries of the movie take place, with questions like where Chet Desmond disappeared to being unresolved to this day. I really love all the stuff with Chet and Sam Stanley, it's a lot more light-hearted and funny while still being really engaging. Also gotta mention David Bowie as Philip Jeffries, who shows up for the single most incoherent scene in all of Twin Peaks. I still have no idea what's happening here, even after watching it three times. I also forgot that it's not a clear cut between the FBI stuff at the beginning and the rest of the movie, since Cooper does show up a few more times throughout the story and helps to make the whole thing feel more cohesive. This cut from Cooper to the Twin Peaks side of the story is perfection. Massive shoutouts to Angelo Badalamenti's score, which is maybe his best work. I love the opening theme especially. Really sets the mood that this isn't going to be like your parents' Twin Peaks. Also going to shout out Moira Kelly as Donna. I love Lara Flynn Boyle in the role, and the fact that she's a 10 out of 10 definitely helps, but Kelly plays this more innocent version of Donna incredibly well, to the point that I don't really mind the change in actress past the initial scene or two. She has great chemistry with Cheryl Lee as well, and their relationship is one of the few sacred things in Laura's life at that point, which is why she's so protective of her during the pink room scene. I do wonder what the Lara Flynn Boyle version of this movie would have looked like though. Also really dig Bobby in this. He's not in it much, but the scenes we do get are great. I love when he tries to get Laura to tell him where she was, but all it takes is that gorgeous smile for him to immediately fold. This movie apparently was booed when it premiered at Cannes back in 1992, probably because the audience foolishly thought they would be given closure after the end of season 2. But once you look past that, you can't deny how genius it really is. Number 2. There's fire where you are going. This episode is what made me realise that The Return was one of the best things I've ever watched. Every single plotline is incredibly entertaining, whether it be uncovering new layers of a mystery in the FBI plot, spending more time with characters we love in Twin Peaks, or some of the greatest scenes in fiction with the Dougie plot. The scene of Bobby and Shelley and Becky at the Double R is one of my favourites in The Return. You really feel for Bobby when Shelley runs off to neck with his dickhead, and then it gets even better when the gunshot goes off and Bobby's trying to deal with the situation, while this woman is just constantly honking her horn. Bobby's reaction here is pretty much me the entire time I'm watching this show. The FBI guys are investigating the spot where Bill Hastings apparently met up with Major Briggs, and this scene has some real good Lynch stuff going on. Also get to see Gordon munching on donuts, which is quality stuff. The real highlight of the episode is the Dougie plot, when the Mitchum brothers take Dougie out into the desert breaking bad style to murder him. 
But it turns out Dougie's got cherry pie with him, which Brad dreamed about, so it's all good and now they're best friends. This last scene of them hanging out and having pie while this beautiful song plays on the piano is the return at its most wholesome. And overall this episode never fails to give me that warm feeling inside. So much of a return is dark and miserable, but episodes like this prove that it's not all doom and gloom. I also really like the scene of Frank and Hawk looking over this map. I just enjoy watching these two guys talk to each other. I was probably a bit brief for this one, but it's kind of hard for me to properly articulate precisely why this episode hits so good, so just let it be known that it's my favourite episode of a return, and one of the best experiences I've had watching Twin Peaks. Number 1. May the Giant Be With You When I started making this video, I thought the top spot would for sure go to an episode of a return, but when I got to the season 2 opener, I was completely blown away. This episode is everything I love about Twin Peaks distilled into 90 minutes. The opening scene immediately lets us know that this season is going to be weirder, with this guy trolling Cooper for an eternity, and then the giant showing up to say some cryptic shit. The scene where Lucy updates Cooper on all the shit that went down during the night is great. Leo Johnson was shot, Jacques Renault was strangled, the mill burned, Shelly and Pete got smoke inhalation, Catherine and Josie are missing, Nadine is in a coma from taking sleeping pills. How long have I been out? Leland's rocking his new white-haired look, and this scene where he and the horn boys start jiving is iconic, complete with Ben hitting the gritty on the desk. Even the little scenes are memorable, like this one with Donna and Maddie where she decides she hates her glasses, which is a shame because I thought she looked cute in them. Donna's all bad bitch mode now with Laura's sunnies and smoking cigs, but James doesn't seem very into it. This scene with Ed explaining his part of Nadine and how he shot her eye out is touching, but Albert doesn't seem to think so. Bobby and Shelly declare their love for each other, that's cute. The scene with the Horn Bros and Hank is really funny. And this episode also has my favourite scene in all of Twin Peaks, Major Briggs' vision. This incredible moment comes out of fucking nowhere. And similar to Albert's Gandhi speech, it completely changes how you perceive not just Major Briggs, but Bobby as well. This scene is the turning point for his entire character. And while he still has some more dickish phases to go through before he gets there, it's what leads him to being the upstanding man we see in the return. Both Dana Ashbrook and Don Davis are exceptional, and perfectly sell what could come across as a pretty silly scene. So throughout this episode we get Lynchian weirdness, heartfelt conversations, hilarity, more investigation stuff, silly dancing, Albert, and some truly scary shit. While the last 10 or so episodes have all been very convincing candidates for the best episode, this one stands above the rest in my opinion for being such a perfect representation of everything Twin Peaks can offer, and for that reason I'm officially declaring it as my favourite episode of one of my favourite shows. Well thank god that's over. This video has been one that I've been wanting to make for ages, so I tried my hardest to make it the best it could possibly be. I got plenty of feedback on my Breaking Bad ranking videos, mainly pertaining to how I just recapped the episodes with minimal comment and their quality, so I made a conscious effort to fix that with this video, hence why it ended up being so damn long. Big thanks to all my subscribers who haven't unsubscribed during the past couple of months, I promise I'll get back to the Breaking Bad universe, eventually. Shoutouts to Ian Buchanan for his awesome cameo, definitely recommend checking him out if you're a loyal dickhead like me. I wanted to get more cameos but I'm too broke for that shit. And of course special thanks to you for watching to the end of this video, I hope. This video was made as a celebration of all of Twin Peaks, and I hope you got something out of it whether you've been a fan for 25 years or just watched it a week ago. Follow me on Twitter, join my Discord, yada yada, and I'll see you again in 25 years.